Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Victoria City Hall, uh, located on the traditional territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt people, and to our City Council meeting of Thursday, November the 10th. Uh, we publish our agenda for Council and the public uh, on the Friday previous to the Council meeting. Uh, and as life goes on between Friday and Thursday, there are some updates and amendments to the agenda since it was published. So I'm going to ask our city clerk, Mr. Coates, uh, to read for council and the public the changes to the agenda. Mr. Coates. Thank you, Mayor Helps. Members of council, uh, the changes tonight, firstly in section E, public and statutory hearings. There is late correspondence added to the public hearing for the rezoning application for 115 Moss Street. In section F, request to address council, there are nine late late names that have been added to the speakers list. And lastly, in Section H, reports of committees, uh, the November 10th uh, Committee of the Whole report has been added. Thank you very much, Council. With that, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Thanks. Moved by Councillor Coleman, seconded by Councillor Alto. Council, are there any changes to the agenda? Okay. Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, we have three sets of minutes from June 23rd, July the 14th, and October the 13th. Uh, Thanks. Moved by Councillor Loveday. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Alto. Council, does anyone have any correction to any of the sets of minutes? Okay. Seeing none, then all those in favour of adopting the three sets of minutes. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we move on to requests to address Council. Uh, we have six in this section. Thanks. Moved by Councillor Coleman. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Alto. Uh, thank you. Uh, all those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. Um, our first request to address council is from one of our colleagues uh, in uh, View Royal, and I would like to make a motion to allow him 10 minutes to address us uh, as a fellow colleague. Okay, seconded by Councillor uh, Isaac. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, before, Excuse me, Mayor Helps. Yes. Um, just the, uh, the poet laureate oh, is first on the oh agenda. Oh, my goodness. I forgot poetry. Yvonne, I'm so sorry. No, I, I was, I was, and then Mr. Co welcome. So I'd like to introduce Yvonne Blomer, our wonderful poet laureate, and I love poetry, and I'm sorry for skipping so quickly ahead. Yvonne, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you um, for the reminder also. Yes. Um, I just have a couple of things to say today before I read my poem. Um, I'm going to read a quote from Don Cher, an American poet. Poets are kind of like... It's a bad metaphor, but canaries in a coal mine. They have a sense for things that are in the air, partly because that's what they do. They think about things that are going on, but partly because they take their own personal experience and see how that fits in with what they see in the world. A lot of people might think that poetry is very abstract, or that it has to do with having your head in the clouds. But poets actually walk on the earth. They're grounded, feet first, pointing forward. They're moving around and paying attention at every moment. And Don Cher has said that in response to what's happened in the world this week. Yesterday was the 78th anniversary of Crystal Night, and the day before, Trump was elected as president. It is a tough world. I want Canada to continue its work in slowly moving forward. I want us to protect the oceans. I don't want the Mackenzie overpass to be built. <laughs> I'd rather we all got out of our cars. Those are my concerns as I speak right now. Um, but the poem I'm going to read comes from Eastern Europe and in honor of Crystal Knight. In 2012, I was in Lithuania, Vilnius, and I took a trip on a bus with other writers and to a place called Panerai. And here's a poem from that experience. Thank you for listening. And it's inspired by Adorno, who said, after World War II, how can there be beauty or poetry after Auschwitz? I confess we ate chocolate. First, the bus driver kept getting lost, and those on it began to wonder from what edge into what ditch we would drop. Rain. Let me speak of rain in the Baltic. Rain filled the narrow pitted roads 
hung from trees while branches scraped the bus's roof and slaughtered peace, leaving cracks in all our frail judgments. When we arrived at the pristine compound in the middle of the wood and rain, we stood umbrella to umbrella. We loved our guide, her Austrian accent and suit, her brown hair and meager raincoat. We were not in Austria, but in the complicated village of Panerai, outside Vilnius, where the Russians dug pits to hide munitions, and the Germans used them for other things. Have I mentioned the hot coffee and rich rye bread, the currants I'd eaten that morning, how each seedy berry bled a story grown from fields once graves? She talked and we followed, Jews and Catholics, some with their German heritage on their faces, some from New York or other places on this earth. She led us to the edge of a pit, a sloped saucer green with grass. She led us there to speak of numbers, of the half-starved men brought to sort through things, of the villagers who came as if to market to find new shoes and clothes, came in rain. In the small museum and the rain, we read everything. Like crows, we pecked down to the marrow of some bitter carrion. Like wolves, we combed for hope, the story. The Japanese official who issued visas, the music and poetry of the captives. We were wet and huddled as a group. Then each of us, alone, walked onto the bus. Silence rode us back to the city. In our wet socks and our silence, we shared shards of dark chocolate. Thank you for listening. Wow, thank you for reading. Should never forget poetry. Um, we will now move on to the requests for to address council section of the meeting. Um, we've approved the requests. We've approved Councillor Rogers to speak for 10 minutes. But before I invite anyone up uh, for this section, um, as well as for the public hearing that will follow, and then for section F, uh, the later requests to address council, I just want to explain for everyone present uh, how this portion and these portions of the meetings work. So other than Councillor Rogers, uh, everyone who is signed up to address council uh, or who speaks at the public hearing has five minutes. Uh, there's a timer at the podium. It's green when you start. It goes yellow at one minute, uh, and at zero minutes, it turns red. Uh, when it gets to zero, I ask uh, that you stop speaking um, so that it's fair and everybody has the same amount of time to address us. Uh, and I will uh, cut you off at zero again uh, for reasons of fairness. Um, some people in these chambers uh, have stood up at this podium many times, and some people are standing up at the podium for the first time. Uh, and whether you've stood here before or are standing here for the first time, uh, council requests that there's no uh, clapping uh, or booing. Um, if you're standing there for the first time or the many time and someone claps, it feels great. Uh, if people boo, it feels terrible. And neither clapping nor booing uh, create a safe space for exchange. And we do hope that these chambers are a safe space for exchange. So just remember that uh, as some topics do tend to get heated, uh, silence is the appropriate response so that everyone has uh, equal voice and fairness. Um, that's it. Uh, and with that, I will invite uh, Councillor Rogers up to kick it off. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak about an exciting opportunity for, for the region. The Victoria Waterways Loop is, um, like we just want to describe, as a whole new paddle and portage experience. Um, we realize that there are two loops are better than one, and uh, you can see that there's the regional trail of the Galloping Goose and the ENN that uh, will likely be completed in 2017, and we see there is great opportunity for an equivalent water loop at the same time. 
we have a map that uh, shows the, the details, uh, the access points, the main route and uh, the auxiliary um, uh, side routes, if you like. And as you can see, um, the, the way the map goes, uh, we do not venture any further into the, uh, the Portage Inlet. We don't go near uh, Creek Flower or Colquitt's Creeks. Uh, it's, um, uh, we, we take it to that, um, that access point where the portage is. The loop has uh, many features. It is uh, a fun, healthy, non-polluting regional recreational opportunity with 15 kilometers and in a circle route with a one kilometer portage section. Uh, it's a very unique combination of inlet, harbor, and coastal experiences that is really quite unique, I think, in North America. It includes many amenities that, uh, such as accommodation, restaurants, washrooms, drinking fountains, and it showcases the diverse and rich heritage and, and First Nations culture that we have. It promotes environmental and uh, awareness and stewardship, and it opens many opportunities for region economic development. As you, this is the beginning of, uh, of the Victoria Watersways Loop, uh, the Songhees Point Beach in the Inner Harbor. It is also, we are encouraging with the BC Marine Trails to be their point of, of start, uh, beginning, if you like, for the coastal, uh, the Salish Sea Coastal Marine Trail. The uh, one kilometer portage route that I mentioned is in Viral and 99% built. You can see it goes through Portage Park, a little bit on the e &N, along the island highway, and the section along the, um, um, the shoreline is the shoreline trail that uh, we just built uh, last year. And as you can see, we already have uh, popularity with the kayakers on the portage trail. This is in, in uh, Portage Park along the e &N. And um, Viewwell invested $50,000 mil $50 $50, uh, for the shoreline access ramp here. And uh, this enables, um, uh, we think, um, pretty much 99% access uh, during um, the 12 months of the year. And it also helps to avoid uh, people going into the mud flats, which is a highly sensitive ecosystem. Our objectives, let me just claim, state for the record that we are uh, a nonprofit group of uh, dedicated volunteers. There's no profit uh, uh, margin for us at all. And what we're doing is we're promoting an ease of use for all ages and abilities. Uh, we want to have uh, wayfinding signs along the Portage Trail so people can find their way, as well as signposting the rest stops so uh, boaters know where they can launch and, and come ashore. We are providing details about each of the access points on our website, vicwaterloop.ca, and we uh, will want to ensure that uh, the public docks are paddle friendly, that they're built to accommodate easy access both in and out of the water. We also want to encourage paddle safe, paddling safety. Uh, we want to improve the, uh, the safety at the Gorge Rapids, um, both in terms of warning signage and looking to see what kind of dock portage route there, there might be. We want to ensure responsible paddling, best practices, and a respect for the sensitive environment. We are providing public information, both in terms of uh, the, the brochure that I think you might have received a copy of, our website, and uh, we we'll even hope to have an iPhone app that's available to the public. And it is important for us to gain municipal, public, and business support and awareness for the project. And here's a couple of paddle boarders on the uh, sunset in, in the gorge there. Environmental protection, as I say, is, is really critical. We want to achieve a responsible balance between recreation and the environment. And our brochure has a section uh, dedicated to, uh, to wildlife awareness, ensuring that uh, responsible behavior. The loop is designed to keep paddlers on the path, thus avoiding mudflats, sensitive streams, and estuaries, and so forth. We will uh, obviously want to ensure uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans compliance with any public dock accesses, uh, existing or new. And uh, with respect to the environmental awareness, we, we will continue to uh, engage with the public. We recognize the, uh, the bird sanctuary that was uh, established in 1923 that goes from 10 mile point through all the way into the Portage Inlet. And in fact, we uh, recognize that further into the Mill Stream estuary, which is, is also really critical. Boating safety and, and education. We want folks to be aware of uh, the tides and currents, particularly in the Gorge Silicon Narrows. 
We want to make use of the local resources and experts for paddling programs and courses. Uh, we want people to be aware of survival courses, such as swim to survive programs that uh, we, we see in, in recreational programs. Um, we'd like to use the, the um, people to be aware and using the loop sections according to the weather conditions and their paddling ability. It is important to comply with the rules. Uh, safety in the, the busy Victoria Inner Harbor is important. Um, Transport Canada has the Partnership and Safety brochure, and we have uh, that online as well. And indeed, it's also uh, important to observe the security requirements within the Esquimalt Harbor, and we're providing that contact information. And as you can see, here's the paddler's channel, shown in yellow, and that we will be um, making sure that folks are aware. We've, I've had a meeting with the Victoria Harbour Master, and she's really encouraged that uh, our initiatives are bringing forward and publicizing and, and making people aware of those critical points for the overall safety of, of uh, the paddling community. The uh, Gorge Rapids is, is a particular concern. We are, again, wanting to ensure that the public is aware of the tidal currents that can exist there. Uh, we feel that warning signs um, uh, will be necessary to install. Of course, you know, that'll take some coordination and cooperation for that. We're also exploring portage opportunities. Um, as you know, the Squamalt side does have the walkway under the bridge already, and we've had preliminary discussions and feasibility options in that, and it is really important that we bring in the Songhees First Nations for consultation and guidance. And once again, we want to make sure that we meet the DFO regulations, both uh, in terms and as well as the, any mitigation requirements. So, how can municipalities help us? We would really appreciate having the support for the Victoria Waterways Loop as a regional recreational amenity. Uh, we would hope that uh, each municipality will adopt wayfinding signage with our logo. Um, we are making our other uh, updated renditions of the uh, brochure, and we hope that uh, municipalities will, will be willing to print and distribute this, this uh, flyer for the public. Um, any public docks that exist or are being built will be uh, there uh, to accommodate ease of use. We hope that municipalities will include the loop in their municipal parks and trails mapping. And as well, we hope that we can all work together with Esquimalt and the regional district to design and build the best um, portage opportunities and, and safety features as necessary in the Tilikum Rapids. I want to bring a, a point that uh, Victoria, as you know, had uh, ranked number seven in the world's cities, and um, the, the tourists do appreciate it. The uh, Condon Nasa Traveler uh, did the survey with some 300,000 um, members. Um, Victoria ranked number seven out of 606 cities, and as you can see, um, they, they note that it's perfect for walking and uh, gazing in the distance, an excellent opportunity for outdoor activities, and they specifically mention to take a kayak tour of the Victoria Harbor. We just want to add and beyond. The Sailor's Sea uh, is uh, going to be an excellent link to, uh, to link that um, uh, the Victoria Waterways Loop to Vancouver, ranking number six, and we do have the support of Victoria Tourism and the West Shore Chamber of Commerce. I wanted to point out um, uh, Parks Canada, the historic uh, Fiskard Lighthouse, and Fort Rod Hill. Uh, they have this fabulous accommodation um, there on their grounds, and Parks Canada is, is a keen supporter and uh, wants to work with uh, the Waterways Loop to encourage um, folks to come and stay there as well. So thank you very much. There is a patch of blue for you. We look forward to seeing you on the water. Thank you very much, Councillor Rogers. Sure. Uh, you mentioned safety around the harbour, also in Esquimalt Harbour. Um, given that most of the amenities in the city of Victoria are located on the, uh, the downtown side, has your group considered where safe crossings uh, would be located? Yes. So if people want to access downtown or even Fisherman's Wharf in James Bay? Yes, yes. We are, we are identifying that on the map, uh, again, in consultation with the Victoria Harbour Master. So we're we're working solidly on that aspect. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Rogers. Thank you uh, for your time. Thank you very much, and thanks for all your hard work.
Uh, one thing that I didn't say that I will say now is this is not an opportunity for a back and forth between Council uh, and the people who speak. So we won't be asking you questions. Uh, but if there is something that a councillor, or sorry, that a member of the public uh, says, uh, and uh, we all have your contact information and can follow up with you individually. All right, so with that, next speaker, please, is Ted Smith. Welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council, for giving me an opportunity to speak. My name is Ted Smith. I live at 1375 Fisher Road. I've come before Council tonight to thank you for giving the Victoria Cannabis Buyers Club and as well the Vancouver Island Compassion Society, although I don't believe they intend upon in the interim opening one up, but certainly um, last week the council voted seven to one in favor of giving the, the VCBC an exemption to consume cannabis uh, on the site of its dispensary on Johnson Street. And I just want to say on behalf of the membership that we really, really appreciate you doing that and that we know that the council intended upon helping us keep our room when the rules were brought in. I wish I would have been able to be more involved but ironically, the regulations passed the evening that my love, Gail Quinn, died. Literally, you were in council when you passed these bylaws when she died in my arms. And so I haven't been able to be here to be involved in the process, obviously. And I just feel like I'm coming back to life now myself. And so it was really distressing to have these rules passed and our, our box, our smoking room, that is, closed because that smoking room is really the community in our club. It is just a store without it. It's what separates us from the others. And I know the council has got issues with for-profit, not-for-profit. Well, our dispensary was a for-profit store until four years ago when I turned it into a non-profit. So in a way, it's the spirit of the organization that matters more than the, the structure. And I, I also have to say that I would hope that the council would not only support our club, but other places. Um, I realize that there's jurisdictional issues and, and battles to, to be fought. Um, in fact, uh, despite caring for Gail, uh, this summer I formed what we've called the BC Independent Cannabis Alliance um, to help the provincial government uh, deal with the legalization scheme that the federal government has initiated. And having lounges is actually really critical for not only people that use cannabis, but local economies. Um, cities like Victoria would do very well to have lounges serving cannabis foods and uh, catering to our community. Uh, British Columbia has got a reputation around the world for having high-grade cannabis. And if this province which we hope it does, creates a, a sort of BC solution and allows you know, commercial lounges. You will see tourists flocking here from all sorts of places around the world. And it's something we think is critical to you know, not only the citizens here in Victoria that you know, if you rent your home, you can't smoke. And a lot of people rent. And so, you know, they have no option but to, to go out to the street, whether it's, it's medical or not. And I realize that there's a lot more compassion towards the sick, but it's uh, not something that the council can say there's a public nuisance issue. We've had, in one location or another, a, a smoking facility for over 20 years. We've been in this location for 15 years. 
the condominium next door didn't even know we had a smoking room until these like exemption was given to us. So it's not a matter of being a public nuisance or having any evidence that there's a problem with our space or any other. So uh, again, I would like to thank the council for giving us the exemption and uh, just encourage you to uh, do what you can to see that Vapor Lounge has become a part of the city. Thank you for your time and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please, is Christiane Stone. Is Christiane Stone here? Okay, when we get to the end of the list, we'll come back and see if she's arrived. Uh, next, please, is Julia Weintraub. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Sorry, I just got my notes in check here. Mr. Coates, can you stop the clock till she's ready to go? Thanks. Thanks. So, basically, I had a PowerPoint presentation ready to go, and I realized that it was really going to mess me up. So I figured I'm just going to leave the title up and speak from the heart. Um, so I'm constantly bothering the mayor, uh, coming to every appointment I can to talk to her about this, and I feel like it's time for me to be able to look you all in the eyes and tell you how important these places are to me and what they do and what they protect both myself, other members, and the public from. Um, so basically, I, I want to say first and foremost, thank you so much for being open to all of the dialogue and for the vote in favor of the box at the VCBC. I, I appreciate that so much. It is, it is making such a difference for people. But at the same time, um, the same reasons that we're allowing that one place are the same reasons we should consider looking at this from the perspective of someone who really needs it. Um, right now, I have with online and then as well as through paper here, a petition with over 471 signatures and growing of people that use, um, you know, one recreational or medical otherwise uh, lounge in the city, and that's the green ceiling. And basically, uh, this place is open till 11 o'clock. So one of the things that that allows me to do is when the box closes at 6.45, um, if I was working any other job, I would not have to rush over there to try to medicate before I went home. Um, so like most often, uh, it's pretty common sense to understand that cannabis will impair a person. And most people are going to want to be out of the public eye. They don't want to smoke around kids. They don't want to bother anybody and want to be respectful. Um, so they're going to even further go into places that are out of the public eye, which puts you at risk. And especially if you're using it for a medicinal reason and you're not able to run or to fight or to yell, and you're going off into a dark, quiet corner so that you can medicate privately to not bother anybody, that is such a risk. It puts you in such a vulnerable position. Position. And as a, as a female, I have been in that position multiple times. And instead of doing something like that, I can go to a place and have access to uh, just a space. Um, you know, I'd also like to point out this is one of the only places that we're looking at, you know, really finding that doesn't actually sell any cannabis. Everybody that's coming there is bringing their own personal medication. They're bringing their own personal uh, you know, cannabis to smoke or to vape, and it also gives them access to equipment that they wouldn't otherwise be able to have access to that is way too expensive to be able to buy. Um, personally, I don't have a problem paying $5. I don't know if you've actually gotten any complaints from anybody about having to pay an entrance fee, um, but I'm more than happy to pay that entrance fee because as a result, I'm able to use a device that's classified by Health Canada that costs $800 to buy, and I can use it right then and there if I need it. I don't have to store it at home. I don't put anyone else at risk that I live with. I don't have to worry about any of my roommate's kids finding it and explaining it. I can just go there when I need it. And, and that's great for me. And the thought that that's not going to be available and I'm going to be put back out onto the streets really, really scares me. Um, the other thing, you know, there's a lot of things there that I don't think the council's really aware of. Um, it, one of the biggest, it provides an alcohol-free venue. Um, when you're when you're sick, you you don't go out. And the idea you might want to go to a show or go see a performer, uh, but standing body to body to set with someone at a bar, 
that's that's not feasible in in so many situations but when you're able to go to a place where you can be sitting down and you can medicate and you can relax you don't need to worry about it uh, people are able to participate in so many activities they wouldn't have available to them otherwise and that is so vital um, now I also asked um, the the owners beforehand before I did this and I've, I've already offered this to the mayor who's graciously accepted but please I'd like to invite you on behalf of everybody to come and see the place. Um, we are more than happy to, they will close it down, we could do it before hours, after hours, so you can come and see the art supplies that are there, the local artists that have their art on display, the people who have come and had venues, the info about infused yoga classes for people with, uh, you know, scoliosis and things like that. There's so much more going on that I think you're not quite aware of and before this place gets shut down or taken away um, please have a look and come and see it um, I really appreciate your open mind and attitude and and it's honestly on behalf of so many people I really want to thank you I know you're gonna get a bunch of really cheesy ridiculous homemade thank you cards so, <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much have a great night we'll look forward to our thank you cards uh, next speaker please is Joanne Rogers Is Joanne Rogers here? Okay, we'll come back to her after we come back to Christiane Stone. Uh, is Mary Beth Burton here? Excellent. Welcome. Thank you. Well, it's been 20 days since I moved to the city of Victoria from the hinterlands of Oak Bay, and I got the warmest welcome on a Friday when our garbage delivery fellow went to the side of the house and brought out our garbage cans because the newbies didn't know when garbage day was. So I sent a tweet out. It was Random Act of Kindness Day, and uh, it was if anybody's missed a garbage day, you know how grateful you are. Um, I watched uh, the live streaming this morning, so I know how the Committee of the Whole went. And I'm not going to take up a lot of your time because this has certainly been something that's been well discussed, the building at 220 Cook Street, Cook and Oliphant. Um, I attended all of the stakeholder meetings in August, September, October as a consultant with Urban Core. I'm going to tell you all about it at the public hearing. Uh, Councillor Loveday, I did want to direct you to cookstvillage.com. I worked really hard over the last seven days to help with the information and to curb some of the misinformation. And um, I look forward to seeing you all at the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're going to go back and ask, is Christiane Stone, uh, has she arrived? And Joanne Rogers. Okay, we may be gracious and add them again at the second request to address section. Um, but for now, we are going to move on to proclamations. Uh, and we do have one proclamation this evening. And Mr. Coates, if you could read uh, the title of the proclamation, please. It's Unite to End Violence Against Women Day, November 25th, 2016. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Isaac, seconded by Councillor Thornton Joe. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge the folks in the front row uh, who have brought this to our attention today. Thank you very much for your hard work. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you very much. We move on now to a rezoning application for 115 Moss Street. Uh, and before we begin the public hearing, I'm going to ask our staff in the planning department to outline for council and the public the matters under consideration this Mayor evening. Helps. Yes, Councillor Thornton Joe. Uh, Mayor Helps, it's, I, it's come to my attention that I have a uh, relative that lives uh, directly across the street from this application. So due to abundance of caution, I'll be uh, excusing myself from this. Thank you very much. We'll just wait till Councillor Thornton Joe leaves. Over to you, Ms. Taylor. Thank you. Good, mor uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Helps and members of Council. The proposal is to rezone 115 Moss Street from the single family dwelling district zone to the restricted small lot two story dwelling district zone to permit the creation of three small lots and the construction of two small lot houses. The applicant would retain the existing dwelling unit. There is a concurrent development permit with variances application to construct two new small lot houses and carry, carry out some interior and exterior alterations to the existing single family dwelling. The applicant is proposing to reduce the lot widths of lot A and lot C, the side yard setbacks of lot B, and allowing the parking space to be located in the front yard of lot B, which contains the existing dwelling unit. Moss Street is considered a people priority greenway, and the applicant would be providing 0 0.6 
0.86 metres of road dedication at the time of subdivision to, to achieve the objectives of the Greenways Plan. The matter for Council's consideration is the supportability of the rezoning of the subject property and the associated variances required to facilitate this development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Taylor. Uh, I'm now going to open the hearing and we'll begin with the applicant uh, who has 15 minutes to make a presentation uh, for Council and the public. Welcome. Thank you. Use that. Um, <clears throat> Mayor, members of council, my name is uh, Rob Mickleberry, and I'm here to speak to you about the property we are rezoning and the new homes we would like to build at 115 Moss Street. As noted in the planning department report recommending our application, our plan is to relocate, renovate, and rejuvenate the existing house built in 1928. Thank you. And construct two additional new homes on the property which is currently uh, two legal lots. The current permitted use would be for two R1B dwellings. My company, Prodigy Development Services, has built many small lot houses over the last 20 years. And it is a type of housing that I'm a very strong advocate for because I believe it's a great way to add density in a gradual way and still maintain the single family home character of a neighborhood. I've reviewed all the city's small lot zoning policies and guidelines and our project meets virtually all of them. The uh, 10 meter or 33 foot minimum lot width was originally derived from um, by dividing two 15 meter or 50 foot lots into three lots. Now you would never tear down two houses on 50 foot lots to construct three small lot houses. Uh, it doesn't make sense economically and, and ethically. Uh, this is an extremely rare, possibly only circumstance where we can keep and revitalize the existing house uh, and create two new houses using the 10 meter lot widths that were anticipated when the small lot pol policies were written. The benefits of our proposal are one, we're saving the existing house. The city policy is to retain existing homes wherever possible. Uh, two, we are providing a variety and richness of housing types while maintaining the single family character of the neighborhood. Three, we are adding only one additional home while utilizing the existing infrastructure. Uh, four, while these are small lots at approximately 4,000 square feet, they're almost 1,100 square feet larger than the minimum in the zone. And uh, they're comparable in size to many of the lots in the surrounding neighborhood. Five. These homes will be less expensive than new R1B houses that are permitted to be built there. Six, the proposed homes are totally in scale with the neighboring homes. The designs are respectful to the neighboring homes. They would have similar setbacks to the neighboring houses and their massing is cohesive with the neighborhood. And seven, at a time when the CRD is under pressure to accommodate more residents, this allows the city to add one additional family dwell, single family dwelling within its borders in a very understated way. Now, we have been working with the planning department and neighbors for well over a year now on this application. A year ago, we presented information to the neighbors in hope of getting some input into the design of these small lot homes. The feedback that we received was that there's a concern of a lack of parking on the street, a concern over removal of the trees and foliage, and a loss of open space. This application has a total of six off-street parking spaces for three dwelling units. Two R1B homes would have four off-street parking spaces for possibly four dwelling units if they contain secondary suites in the homes. This would put more pressure on the already tight parking situation on the street. We are preserving all the protected trees identified by a professional arborist outside of the building envelope and planting new trees that should thrive in their new locations. We will be putting in a great deal new planting as well as new fences. It's important to note that the same amount of foliage will be lost with two new R1B homes. There will be a loss of green space, but the site coverage of these three homes is less than what's permitted under the existing zoning. No additional accessory buildings are permitted in the small lot zone without amending the development permit. 
We have incorporated design features to address the concerns of neighbours who were prepared to talk with us about our project, as well as all the comments from the city. We pulled all the adjoining properties required in the small lot house guidelines and received the support of all the neighbours except for the owners at 107 and 119 Moss Street. These two adjacent neighbours who oppose our application have chosen not to discuss details of our proposal with us. They have told us that their preference is to have two new homes built on the lots under the existing zoning. Obviously this would require only a building permit approval to proceed. I have been regularly updating them with drawings as they have been modified for the city and I've also sent letters to them to, uh, to let them know how our designs has tried to be respectful of their properties and other amenities we will be providing such as fencing, planting, screens and retaining walls. We believe their concerns about our ex development exist regardless of what is built next to them. We've gone out of our way to contact these neighbours to be able to address their concerns but as they have been unwilling to connect with us, we are unable to discern exactly what they oppose about our proposal. I, I did, however, uh, have a, a very short conversation at the last minute with uh, the neighbour at uh, 107 Moss just before this meeting to discuss some concerns about trees. So I, I'm not, we didn't really, weren't able to resolve anything, but I'm hoping that uh, we can work our way through that. Two R1B houses may have more unsettling consequences than the smaller homes we are proposing. Our side yard setbacks and the setbacks in the current zoning are exactly the same. Our front and rear yard setbacks also meet the R1B guidelines. The only setbacks that don't meet R1B are adjacent to the house in the middle. The total floor area of the two R1B houses could be the same as the three houses we are proposing. The R1B houses are simply larger buildings. The R1B homes can contain secondary suites or possibly garden suites in the future. That could mean there would be four off-street parking spaces for four dwelling units. We are proposing six spaces for three dwelling units and no secondary suites are permitted in the small lot zoning. The R1B option has the potential to cause more parking issues on the street. And finally, the existing home would have to be demolished as it's not feasible to retain and restore this home on the property in a two lot configuration. Under the existing zone, we simply need to get a building permit for construction with no input from the planning department or neighbours. The decision as to whether these new homes would have secondary suites would be up to the future homeowners. Property values are very high in Fairfield. The combined value of the three proposed homes will be roughly the same as what the two new homes built under R1B could, zone could be. Economic condition result in construction of larger homes due to the high cost of land. The existing home is in poor shape and too small to be considered for any kind of conversion to multiple suites as has been suggested. But in the context of the project that we're proposing, it is economically viable to bring a new lease on life to this single family home. We believe we've come up with a very creative and reasoned design for this property that not only preserves the existing home, but also creates two new smaller homes. It appears to meet all the objectives of the city's small lot house policy, and the new homes fit in very well with the neighboring homes on Moss Street. The finished project will triple the existing tax base for the property without requiring any additional infrastructure or demands on city services. At a time when the CRD is under pressure to accommodate more residents and expand the region's urban containment boundaries, we believe that this is exactly the kind of project that Victoria should be looking to add, looking at to add additional housing gradually within its borders. Uh, public hearings tend to become very emotional and sometimes information can be skewed at the heat of the moment. Uh, public hearings are also relatively short, but applications such as ours take a great deal of time, resources and money. We trust that all of the work that has been done by all parties in good faith will be given full consideration. There's always a fear of change and a fear of the unknown. Council just needs to decide what's right for the city in this, in this uh, instance. I would argue that the disruption of a project like this to the neighborhood is the construction activity and not the small lot houses themselves. I will endeavour to make sure the construction activities proceed as smoothly as possible. Once the work is complete, the new homes will become part of the community as all the other small lot homes that have been built in the city have become. This, this is a good project. We're saving and restoring the existing house and we're constructing 
two new smaller homes at a time when the trend is to build larger homes in this neighborhood. They will add to a robust spectrum of housing in the neighborhood. I hope that you will be able to support our application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I go to the public, Council, are there any questions at this time for the applicant? Yes, Councillor Madoff. Yes, thank you. Um, you said that it, the, the existing house will be restored, and I'm trying to understand, looking at it, it appeared to be uh, that the exterior had been changed quite dramatically. I'm, I'm assuming it's probably going to be stripped down to the studs and basically reconstructed. So I'm just trying to understand the, the use of the term restoring. The, the, it's our plan to um, sort of maintain the exterior of the building as much as possible. There is a modification uh, where the new front entry will be located because the house is going to be rotated on its foundations 90 degrees. But if you compare all of the elevations and the finishes with what is there now, it's, it's, it's pretty much the same. Um, the interior will be brought to the studs. There's, uh, there's an obit tube wiring. There's um, some, some structural failure that needs to be uh, repaired. And also, we just, we we're going to modernize it to you know, give it a new lease on life for the next however many years that uh, we can extend it for. In your presentation, do you have the um, north and south elevations as well as the... Um, yes, they should be there. The west. There are all the elevations there. Okay. Thank you. And, and my second question, um, I'm, you referenced how long you've been working on this, and I know that, that, that time is money, and that it's, it's obviously been a significant investment to bring it to this point, and that part of the impetus was responding to the, um, the growth strategies and the need for accommodation in the region and, and basically avoiding urban sprawl and that kind of thing. So what I'm trying to understand is if you had gone with the entitlement on the existing property, you could have built two single family homes with secondary suites, which would have housed four uh, households. This will house three households. So I'm just trying to understand why you see this being advantageous over the other approach. Well, with this application, there will be three households. There's a possibility that there would be only two households in the, the two R1B homes if that was built. I mean, it's, it's at the owner's option to, to create that secondary suite. Um, you know, there are a number of secondary suites in this neighborhood. There's also a number of houses that don't have secondary suites in them. Um, that's, it's, it's really at the option of, of the, the owner of the house or the... Or the builder of the house. Or the builder, perhaps. Right. It, and we have to evaluate the market when we're making that decision as yep, well. Exactly. Thank you. Are there any further questions for the applicant at this time? Okay. Uh, seeing none, there may be some questions that arise during the hearing. We may call you back up. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, this is now an opportunity for members of the public who wish to speak on the application uh, at 115 Moss Street. Um, it's an open mic, so come on up. Five minutes each. Um, yellow at one minute, red at zero, and uh, we'll go from there. And if you could identify your name and your address so we understand how close you live to the subject property. Hi there. Um, my name is Carl Rebner. I am the neighbor to the property at 119 Moss Street. Um, uh, as identified, uh, one of the uh, individuals that haven't communicated with um, uh, the developer, however, uh, that's not the case. Um, uh, I am pro-development uh, for densification and provide ho uh, affordable housing. Um, however, this proposal, I feel, does not fit this objectives and happy to work with the developer and see that. Um, there's several points I'd like to make, and I'm just going to relate it to, as a layman, I'm not in the developing business, I'm not understanding of uh, codes and bylaws, but um, in terms of, as I read through the small lot housing rezoning policy, uh, the first point there was to address uh, Victoria being one of the least affordable um, cities in, um, in Canada. Um, the developer said that these properties would go for 1.3 million each, um, and again, not having the ability to have secondary housing um, or rent uh, suites of any sort, so it doesn't really provide for affordable housing. That would be my first point. Um, in revitalizing the neighborhood, um, you know, initially when he came to us, he asked us whether we'd, uh, there was two proposals he had. One was for a two house proposal and one was for a three. Um, you know, our proposal back to him was for supporting the, the two. Uh, it does not mean that, and I still don't understand, and you know, perhaps clarification later might help us understand why the existing house cannot be retained as part of a two house property. Um, 
And um, you know, in terms of optimal use of neighborhood infrastructure, again, my point of having two homes with um, with uh, rental suites or uh, garden suites, again, I think uses the infrastructure. Um, meeting the ne needing change in wants and, and values of the existing neighbors is another point made in the policy. Um, you know, initially uh, there, there wasn't the support of 75%. Um, I think many of you received that email that, uh, and I think we, we spoke with you that that, that um, wasn't there. Um, so we felt a bit distrustful that, uh, you know, the policy, this wasn't proceeding as, as it needed to be. Um, in terms of good neighbor design approach, um, you know, the, I, when I look at the setbacks, you know, I think we push the boundaries in terms of these properties and the massing that is right next to um, the adjoining properties. Um, that provides a concern for us and that does not feel to me to be good neighbor design approach. Um, a bigger one for me is conservation of trees. Um, you know, again, I could be wrong, but I appear to see 40 trees going, particularly those that line our property line, which um, again, without a legal um, uh, uh, legal uh, property assessment, or um, I, um, I would not uh, say that these proper these trees that plan to be uh, taken down on the plan belong uh, to that property. They line our property line and, and should not be taken down. And again, my understanding was two of the four protected trees uh, would be saved, so not all. Um, again, I'm happy to hear um, you know facts to kind of address these concerns that I have, but these are just what I, I see. Um, the location is not double frontage lot, which again, from the small lot zoning, um, was the intent um, to kind of capture the fact that you're on a corner, you can have two homes, and it, it would look um, again more normal and appealing. Um, and in terms of um, you know the visual cohesiveness, again, I can't necessarily see that from the, the designs appear to be stretched out in terms of our house looks a lot wider than, um, than it appears and it really is. So to the degree that you go down um, a Moss Street and then suddenly you have three houses that are um, you know, massed uh, together, again, uh, provides us some concern. Um, and, and also in the small lot zone, it talks about parking not to be in the front um, of the property. And again, maybe I was looking at an old version, but again, that's a concern um, that I have. Um, and um, um, and I think you know from a design perspective, I can't tell from the designs because um, and again, if they can match the architecture of the neighborhood, ours is a 1913 home uh, with many um, you know fine features to the degree that these homes match that. Again, I'm happy to kind of see you know, specific close-up designs to make sure that the the homes do do meet that as well. Um, so in short, what I'd like to say, as pre previously proposed right at the outset, I'm happy with a two-house development that allows for secondary suites, provides uh, 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 more low-income housing or family uh, housing. It allows uh, families to move into the neighborhood so they can supplement their income. And it keeps within 80% of what the homes currently look like on the street today. So thank you again for your time, and I'm open for a dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we'll make sure that your questions get asked. Oh. Oh, sorry, sir. It's 119 Moss Street. Yes, yes thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Uh, hello, my name's Angus Taylor. I live on the other side of 115 Moss Street. I live at 107 Moss Street. I just, I won't take a lot of your time. I'd just like to uh, second uh, everything that the previous speaker said. Uh, again, we were presented originally with a, uh, the, uh, the choice between, or the, there were two proposals, basically the, the three houses on the small lots or regular two houses, and I made it clear that I was in favor of the two house option uh, before that was taken off the table. I'd also like to say that um, it was stated earlier that uh, by the uh, developer that there were only uh, two um, two people uh, opposed to it, the, uh, the neighbors on either side. Uh, that's not the case. There are, are many more people in the neighborhood who have been and are opposed to this uh, three lot uh, proposal. I believe that the, uh, two houses with um, secondary suites would actually provide as much or more in the way of densification while preserving green space and uh, maintaining the look of the of Moss Street and uh, to allow these, you know, densification in in the in terms of the small lot. This is the thin end, edge of the wedge, thin end of the wedge, 
and um, it will, you know, be the beginning of a significant change to uh, uh, Fairfield in this area in the future. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Welcome. Good evening. Um, I really probably don't have any business speaking to this development at all, except that I live in a small lot subdivision and, and, and I know of many more in, in the Fairfield area. Sorry, and, can you, sorry, sorry to interrupt, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, sir. Uh, just your name and your address, please. Oh, it's uh, Stephen Shank, and I live in 1440 Dallas Road. Thank you. So I'm a block and a half away from this. But within this area, there are many uh, narrow houses and lot, lot uh, uh, the cabins and, and, and whatnot. And, and I totally approve of it all. I, uh, I've lived in the neighborhood for 45 years, and I, I just think it's great to, enter, to, to, uh, to modernize and, uh, and, and allow a little new architecture and, uh, to enter. And I, you know, I think it all fits in beautifully with a little bit of foliage. And also, I don't like a big yard anymore. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Joanne Rebner, and I live at 119 Moss Street, directly north of the proposed development. I live in my home with my husband, my 10-year-old daughter, and my 7-year-old son, and we have a tenant as well. We have spent the last eight and a half years on Moss Street, and we have lovingly restored our character home, and we have intention to stay. I'm not opposed to the redevelopment or the development of 115. I'd love to see that old house restored and brought up to shape and, and kept in the big character and, and the big yard. Um, but I'm not opposed to redevelopment. I uh, was very in favor of the alternative, which was the two lots that were originally provided to us um, and the neighborhood by the developer. But I'm not in favor of the small lot zoning. And the rationale for my opposition is as follows. This application has, especially with the signage up on Moss Street, it has destabilized the home prices on Moss. Just this week, across the street from the development, at 106 Moss Street, it was listed for $650,000. It was a 1912 home, and it was marketed as a development site. And even though it's a 50 by 120 lot, it was still marketed as such. The property sold for $820,000. This development proposal is creating market speculation on Moss Street and the neighborhood, and it increases the issue of affordability in our city. It further encourages the refacing of the character and appeal of Fairfield. This is not reflective of the goals and objectives of the small lot rezoning policy, which was to encourage affordability with the two lot development. Oh, sorry, affordability. So with the two lot development, what I see and feel very strongly about is a consistent flow of the street. And more so, like us, a secondary suite provides for affordability for families who move into Fairfield. And that is, that carries on forever. Like once you split up a, 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 a lot into three, that's forever. You can't turn that back. But if you do your two, you've got secondary suites or garden suites, like many people do, and many people have suites on Moss Street. Um, you really create what I think is sustainable housing in a long term, in it, in long term for the city. It also provides affordability for the many people who love to come and live in Fairfield or just live in the city of Victoria and have a nice proximity to downtown where many people work. And as mentioned by the developer, the um, lots are intended to be at 1.3 million each. 
those small lots. Um, the design guidelines outlined in the small lot zoning policy, which is near and dear here, they're not reflective of this proposal in relation to privacy, landscaping, and parking, as the developer also requires a development permit and variances on top of the three lot rezoning. The small lot housing rezoning policy encourages neighborhood consultation during done via peti a petition. The developer had said he had 83% in favor of the development. In actual fact, the Fairfield Community Associated provided the figures to myself and I provided them to others were more closely to a 50-50 split. And this is because of the counting of the number of eligible people within the houses. With three of the seven in favor who just benefited from the sale of 106 Moss Street. Uh, this is repetitive to what others have said, but the developer advised they can only save the original house with three lots, not with two. I just find that odd. I don't understand why you could say that. Um, I'd love to see the old house salvaged, but the reality is in this proposal, this house, this house is not going to look anything like it does today. And when you drive down Moss Street, you're not going to say, oh, look at that old 1928 house. It's going to look like a brand new house, just like the other two little ones on either side of it. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council neighbors. My name is Sally Ross. I am a renter next door at 107. Um, I'm actually not one of the next door neighbors that didn't want to speak to Rob because we have had a couple of nice conversations. And um, I just, I, I really want to reiterate um, that the increase in density that will um, help diversify our neighborhood is in this case, I believe, is to build rental suites in two houses for, uh, for four dwellings instead of three. Um, the issues of affordability and increasing inclusivity and diversity of our neighborhood were brought forth at length um, by those who attended the recent renters forum, um, which is, as, was part of the, um, the Fairfield Gonzalez local area planning process. Um, as a renter, I find the rental housing crisis that we're currently experiencing in this city uh, shocking and terrifying, to say the least. Um, and I believe that this property is uh, at 115 is now providing an opportunity to add to our stock of rental housing. Um, I believe that the, the design and development of the homes would uh, encourage the, the new owner, the buyer, to um, offer a secondary suite, to offer rental housing. Um, there has been a great deal of change already on our block since this application process began. And most recently, as was previously mentioned, uh, the sale of the house across the street at, uh, it was a duplex, 106-108. Uh, um, we understand that it, it has been purchased uh, by a developer. The previous owner told me that it, uh, it was being sold as a teardown. So I am definitely concerned that uh, this, uh, this application is setting a certain kind of precedent for our neighborhood which is not supporting uh, the direction that we, in terms of um, diversification of options that we really need in Fairfield Gonzalez right now. Um, and I would, I would really like to close, this is a much broader um, perspective, but um, it's been very interesting and enlightening, enlightening for me to become um, more engaged in discussion about my neighborhood with my neighbors because of this development. That's, um, the application itself has been uh, a benefit that way. I appreciated being able to sit down in person with Rob Mickleberry on Monday. Um, we discussed the project specifically, but we also uh, more generally discussed matters of energy efficient design, uh, sourcing of local materials, and coordinated efforts to minimize construction waste and maximize recycling. 
Um, so I do believe that um, that Rob RM2, the two Robs, they have the best interests of our community in mind in, in terms of um, those aspects. And uh, But I do maintain my, my position that um, rental housing right now is very important for this community. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm Eleanor Yelston. I'm at 123 Moss. And I just have a short comment. Um, I, I propose the two lot zoning. And for me, it's aesthetics and in keeping with the beauty of, of Moss Street and the, the integrity of the character of the homes that are there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Shelley Soldat. I live on, at uh, 1270 Faithful Street. So I'm sandwiched between a house that's actually on the corner on Moss and another one on the corner of Moss and Faithful. And uh, about a year and a half ago, the small house to my left uh, was sold for about 510000 It was torn down and a, fellow, a couple bought it and they actually took every single tree and plant off the property without consulting me. And one of the trees was actually partly on my property. So I actually was all nestled in with trees and it was really quite lovely and now there's nothing there and the house that was built is quite lovely. It has a suite. But he turned around in less than a year and sold it for 1.4 and he's already on to his next project on Leonard Street. And uh, he's not a pleasant neighbor. But, um, and then to my right, the house that actually the address is on Moss Street, the owner about four or five years ago asked if I would mind if he built a garage. And of course I thought, everyone should have a garage. They didn't have one. We'll take the cars off the street. But what actually ensued was this structure that's two levels and is about 18 feet high, it looks like it, right up to the property line, so the roof line is touching my fence, and it's a corner lot. So I find that really odd, being a corner lot, that you allow a structure that size to be built. And now if it was at the back of my property, that'd be fine. But now I have about an 18-foot wall when I look out my kitchen window, and I no longer see trees, I don't see the sunrise. That's fine, but people are living upstairs, and I didn't think you could have a carriage house unless there was a lane and the first two years were chaos, uh, just with people partying until 3 and 4 in the morning. It's great to have a rental, but the owner doesn't live there. He's in Vancouver. So as a result of that, there are many, many cars now on Faithful Street. And I have trouble backing out of my little single driveway. I, all, you know, I almost hit cars. I have to sort of inch out. And I actually drive over the boulevard a little bit, which I know you're not supposed to do, but I can't get out otherwise. So I'd rather see two lots here with the two homes with maybe suites in each, that's great. But um, I'm fearful of how many cars will be on Faithful with other people visiting. And I, with a lot next to me, with all the trees and all the greenery completely removed, uh, it was really shocking and it was sad. So uh, I'd rather see some more preservation in the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Randy Dunbar. I live on 73 Moss, which is about five houses down from the proposed site. I'll be very quick. I'm not in favor of this plan. I'm in favor, as you've heard other people saying, of two homes, of it splitting into the two lots that it is currently. Um, I, in keeping with the integrity of the neighborhood, I don't think we can densify for profit. Um, we should be densifying in order to make a more diverse neighborhood, and I think that two lots with suites would do that. And I'll just leave it with, I'm very skeptical when we spin a house and slide it into two other houses like a game of Tetris and claim that we're doing that to keep the integrity of an old house. I don't think in any way that's keeping the integrity of a house. I think that that is just, again, trying to densify for profit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. For a second time. 
Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Hirsch. I live at 85 Moss, which is about seven up from 115. Um, yeah, I just thought I'd throw in my two cents. Uh, my criteria for, I guess, judging the proposal would be, does it fit with the character of the neighborhood? Does it retain that cool 100-year-old feel? Um, I know a lot of new homes tend to feel very massive, whether they be, you know, tear downs and rebuild on the standard full-size lot. Um, this, to me, seemed like it was, you know, pretty sympathetic. Three smaller homes rather than potentially two monster homes with that sort of monster home aesthetic that you sometimes get with new builds. Um, Style-wise, they, they seem nice. My only, my only comment in terms of fitting in with the character of the neighborhood and how it might be improved was just the amount of parking that we'll have in the front lawns and the fact that two of them have in, inbuilt garages. I grew up in the suburbs, and um, driveways and inbuilt garages is a pretty suburban uh, kind of character to me. Um, but otherwise, it seems like an interesting, good proposal. Thanks. Great. Thank you for coming. Uh, are there any further speakers? Excellent. Sorry. Yeah. There's lots of time. We have all the time in the world. Good evening. Hi there. Thanks very much. I'm Lois Farron, uh, 84 Moss Street. My husband's with me. He's going to come up next, I guess. So Moss Street is a great street. We have great neighbors, many of whom are here tonight, and I hope they're still talking to me tomorrow. Um, <laughs> the house is a wonderful house. It would be really unfortunate to tear that down, and the reality is that's what's going to happen if we don't get the three lots. Um, we need more densification. The proposal is a wonderful way to get more densification. Uh, many of the small lots uh, that have been built in Fairfield really add, I think, to the diversity and character of the neighborhood. The reality of two homes with rental suites is that there's no guarantee that those are going to be rented. Uh, with three homes, those are potentially three new families that we could welcome as homeowners in our neighborhood, and I would be more than happy to welcome that. Uh, I'm also familiar with many of the other projects that the developer has done and think that they really add to the character of Fairfield. Uh, we've lived in the neighborhood for 20 years, 10 years on Faithful, and uh, now almost 10 years on Moss Street, and we're certainly in favor of the proposal. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Uh, thank you. My name is Robert Hasegawa, and I'm at uh, 84 Moss. And um, my house, if someone gave me the right amount of money, I would move. My kids are getting older, and we're looking to downsize. We love the neighborhood. We don't want to move out of the neighborhood. We look at our options now, and we I don't like doing yard work. I want a small yard. I want a small house. We've had tenants before. I'd prefer not to have a tenant. So this is the kind of house that myself and a bunch of our peers that are, are empty or becoming empty nesters are looking at. So I, I do support this development and being able to keep existing neighbors in the neighborhood uh, just uh, in in keep it the way it is too. And, and again, Rob's done some beautiful developments. We lived on the corner of Faithful in Cambridge. He built two nice houses on Cambridge that we're, we walk by quite regularly and are very proud of to know that Rob's done that development. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mary Dawson, and I live on 25 Bushby Street, and I'm the one that um, behind the development that the um, uh, prodigy did on Doug, uh, Dallas Road. My house is directly behind it, and, and it's brand new, and uh, I'm a widow, and I was downsizing myself, and I wanted to have a smaller place. I have a big standard poodle still, and I needed a small backyard, so, you know, condos aren't conducive to that, really. And uh, so anyway, um, a friend was, you know, going through the neighborhood and he saw this construction. He said, this is the perfect place for you. And uh, so I, uh, I had a look at it and I bought it right on the spot and it's been wonderful. And um, with all due respect to um, the property on Moss across the street from the project, saying that it was, uh, 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 
sold for speculation or whatever. Uh, the house across the street from me on Bushby, uh, the asking price was 800 and some thousand, and it went for 300,000 more than that. And uh, so that's just the way the housing prices, I think, are going in the city, regardless of what the project is across the street. Anyway, I love where I live. My family comes, and my boys, two of my boys live in town, and it is a perfect spot, a tiny little yard, and, uh, you know, the demographics are changing, and, and uh, you know, uh, I just feel a, a very privileged to live in a small lot at home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mark Stoy, where I live at 312 Irving, uh, so I'm not on Moss Street. Uh, I want to talk uh, about something that I haven't heard spoken of very much tonight, and that is integrity. Uh, I want to talk about the integrity of the builder and the integrity of the buildings. I live in a house that was built by Rob and Zebra. And I remember uh, when we moved into the neighborhood at Irving, there was a small house on it, and there were a lot of folks there who were very attached to that house. They'd seen kids grow up in that house. They'd seen folks grow older in that house. And uh, a lot of folks were upset uh, when we were going to be their new prospective neighbors, not least of which because we came from Vancouver, and we all know what people from Vancouver are like. Um, and uh, we bought that piece of land, and I remember how Rob went from neighbor to neighbor to neighbor, showing them and showing them again and taking into consideration what he'd do and inviting them to the other buildings that he'd built to show them and, and, and help them along the process of growing more at ease with this. And there was, still, uh, there was still a lot of objection. And then the house started to shake shape. And one by one, the neighbors came along, and they were surprised. I mean, the, the plans had been the same all along, but they were surprised at the integrity of the building and how open Rob had been the whole time and saying, this is not going to mess with the integrity of the neighborhood. The house is wonderful. We have the neighbors by. It's become a central meeting place on our street, actually, for things like Halloween and summertime. And uh, it fits in. It does not stand out like a sore thumb. And um, I think it comes down to uh, Rob having a very, very high level of integrity and sensitivity to the buildings and the neighborhood, the foliage, things like that. And he has a way of bringing people along. Sometimes they have to see the actual house, and I'd invite folks by our house any time to come check it out and just say, hey, it's okay, I fully understand, it's scary. But when the actual building goes in, um, everybody was very, very happy with it, and of course we were too. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Catherine Koshman. I work for Zebra Design. We are the design company for this project. Um, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things regarding the variances proposed for these lots. Um, there was some questions about the lot width. Um, the only reason we are proposing a variance to the 10 meter lot width is to actually save the existing house and the variance we're requesting is actually only approximately four inches for lots A and lot B, or sorry, lot A and lot C, the ones on either side. Um, the other variances that we're requesting for lot B are the parking to allow it in the front yard and that is basically because the existing design of the lot B home doesn't allow for a garage to have um, a parking stall required um, in the actual building envelope. Um, I'd also like to point out that, we're s that even with the required road dedication with this subdivision, the lot areas of each lot exceed the minimum required area of the R1S2 by approximately 100 square meters. And uh, also with respect to the parking concerns, I'd like to point out that the parking bylaws, and Leanne can correct me if I'm wrong, um, the parking bylaws only require a single parking stall for a single family home. Um, if you have a secondary suite, I do not believe there's actually a, another parking stall required. Um, and our proposal is actually um, having six parking stalls um, for the three Three, three houses. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is that the R1B zone allows for 560 square meters um, on the two lots. 
um, of non-basement floor area, and our proposal is um, for only 545 square meters over the three properties. Um, and I'd also like to point out that the R1B site coverage also has a 40% allowance, and our proposal is only to have about 35%. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Jarrett Clay. I live at 25 Government Street. Um, I just wanted, I felt like I wanted to speak because I really love um, James Bay and then I love Fairfield, but I want to point out that they're two very different communities in their feel. And what I felt like is not really being discussed here is the fact that when you walk down a street like Moss Street, it's one of the few streets left in Victoria that has that feel uh, to it. Um, I don't know exactly how to put it in words, except if you compare it to James Bay, which I love for different reasons, but it's a very eclectic community in its construction. And I think what I'd like to ask council is, do you want an expansion of James Bay or do you want to retain Fairfield? Because when you start playing with lot sizes, that to me is what the end result is gonna be as you go down that slippery slope and lot sizes change, you're just gonna get more and more eclectic and lose the feel of community, which to me is not a density issue because your density is actually probably gonna be higher with two lots than it is with the three houses. So I just ask that the council consider that in their decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any further speakers on 115 Moss Street? for a second time and for a third and final time. Okay, seeing no further speakers, I know there are lots of questions that councillors probably have. I certainly do. So, council, are there questions? Uh, let's start with questions for the applicant. Okay, I'll invite the applicant back up to the podium um, and I'll start with my questions while councillors are getting theirs in order. Um, uh, so my first question, I wasn't sure if I misheard one of the neighbors um, or if uh, it, it's, I heard 40 trees are being cut down. Um, is it 40 or is it four? Uh, and, and can you talk about the, the trees along the lot line that the neighbor, I believe it was at 119 Moss, uh, mentioned? How many trees are being cut down? <laughs> I don't know the exact, it's quite possible in terms of, there's a number of small trees. The site has been sort of allowed to sort of get overgrown a little bit. Um, adjacent to uh, the neighbor to the north, uh, there is a, a raised bed right now that contains an, a number of different trees. Some of them have are scrub trees. Some of them are, are, are fairly substantial. Um, none of them are uh, protected. They're just they're just there. They're just providing this uh, green buffer. So, of protected trees, um, there's one that's diseased that's in the front yard of uh, lot B that will be removed. There is a, a similar tree to that in the front yard of lot C that's being retained. And there's a large fir tree in the back of lot C that is protected and is being retained. Um, I, I, I we have had a, a short chat with the neighbor, and there, you know, if there is a tree there that can be saved and and is, is viable and, and will actually you know flourish in its present location, we'll keep it. I, you know, I'm not I'm certainly not planning. I, we're not going to cut down trees that aren't on our property either. But uh, uh, foundations and excavations can uh, cause damage to trees, and, and that's just a reality. And then we want to plant new trees that are. Uh, in a location that they'll flourish for the you know for the lifetime of that house and the tree. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is a question. I'll start with you. It may also be a question for staff. We've heard a lot about the inability to preserve the existing house um, if it's a two lot subdivision rather than three lots. Can you talk about why? Is it because of the location of the house? Uh, well, the, the the location of the house it's straddling the two existing lots right at the moment. So, and it's and it's not a it's not a large house. It's about uh, uh, it's under it's about seventeen hundred square feet on two levels, I believe. I mean, plus or minus a, a few feet. Um, so it's a small it's a smaller house. 
uh, to start with. Um, it, it, it's not in great shape. It, it's it's uh, had a, a single owner, I believe, for approximately the last 40 or 50 years. Um, but it but it is re uh, restorable, and, and certainly um, the, in the three lot configuration, it is it becomes a little more viable economically to restore it. And I'm not sure there is the economic viability to retain it uh, in the two lot sub subdivision. I believe that the, the land is is too valuable. The house is actually too small for the property. There's just simply not enough square footage. It would be difficult to, um, I think, come up with a marketable home that uh, certainly would meet these other requirements, or, or it would require some substantial renovations and additions to the structure. Okay, so w I guess m to, to clarify, would you need to physically move the house over to retain it if you were going to oh, go absolutely, for Absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Um, there was a suggestion, and I don't know where it comes from, um, the idea of uh, selling these houses for $1.3 million each. W where does that number come from? I, I'm not sure where that came from, but I know there was some discussion even at the committee of the whole meeting as to what comparable small lot homes were selling for in the neighbourhood. Um, and and, and it, I, I, I would suggest to you that I'm not sure that the, the renovated uh, home would sell for quite that much, but it may be close to that when it's all done and I, I don't control the market, I only participate in it. Okay, thank you very much. I have one more question, but it's for staff. So I'll go to staff now and then I'll go to my colleagues for other questions. Um, staff, we've heard a lot about the possibility of building two houses uh, with secondary suites to create more rental housing. Um, I guess I have t one question about that and then one question about the two houses more generally. Can we make people build secondary suites in new houses? No, we cannot make um, owners construct secondary suites in there. Okay, so so as much as we might want secondary suites, and I certainly do, we can't say you must build two houses and they must have secondary suites. That's entirely left up to the uh, either the owner or the builder or the developer. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so that might be something for council to, to consider further down the road as a policy issue. And then the second question with relation to the two houses, um, if the developer was to build two houses, um, I, I just he, he says that he just would need a building permit. So can you explain the process? Um, say this fails, um, he says, okay, I'm going to build two houses. What, what happens and, and what, what are the potential for the, the, the size, the clear cutting of the lots and, and so on, just if we could understand that? So and sorry, I asked about the clear cutting of the lots because I'm thinking about the woman who spoke who said that her neighbor just clear cut the lot and built a giant house. I, I guess, is that possible here with the, the two lots as they exist? Um, to answer the first question, uh, uh, if, uh, tomorrow, if this application is declined, the applicant could come in tomorrow with a building permit application to construct two houses on the, prop on, on, on the lots. Okay, and, and just for, for clarity for council and for the public, and sp especially for me, um, what, what would those two houses have to be? How small or big could they be? We know they don't have to have secondary suites. They, they may or may not, but what, what could be built there, I guess, without coming to council for variances or whatever? Okay. So in terms of floor area, the floor area is slightly under double the maximum floor area for a small lot. In terms of setbacks, the setbacks are um, very similar to the small lot zones, as well as the, the lot coverage is exactly the same um, for both the small lots and the small lot zone and the R1B zone, for okay. 40%. And just for, sorry, my final question, um, not sorry, I think it's important to ask questions. Uh, what, is this, what is the floor area, uh, the allowable floor area for each uh, house, if there were two? Yeah. The maximum floor area um, for, an, a lot, or for a dwelling unit on an R1B zone is um, based on this lot size is 300, and, 300 square meters okay. per dwelling unit. 300 square meters, so each house could be 300 square meters. Yeah, and that excludes the basement level. Excluding the basement level, okay. All right, thank you so much. Um, Council, thanks for your indulgence. Um, are there other questions for the applicant or for staff? Yes, Councillor Alto. I'm not sure if it's for the applicant or the staff, but uh, one of the speakers referenced a concern about uh, ownership of the trees along the property line. 
I'm not sure to whom I would pose the question, but is there a way to clarify who owns the trees on the property line? Is it joint ownership or? Um, the, I mean, they're on the north and south property line, there are quite a number of, of different sized trees. Um, I, I assured uh, one neighbor uh, earlier in the day that we, we, we certainly, it's our intention to cut down any trees that aren't on our property and trees that are on the property line are, are also, <laughs> they can't just be removed. They simply can't be removed. So, um, you know, without a proper survey and such, I, I, I think the bulk of the trees are actually on the, the property line of 115 um, Moss. The, the property to the south, though, uh, there, there are a substantial number of, of larger and smaller trees there. And I'm, I'm hoping that when they were planted, they look like they were planted sort of on one side of the property line or other, there is a fence there. So I'm hoping that's that's fairly obvious there as well, and that there there we we, we shouldn't really run into any conflict there. I mean, I've, I've built a number of homes, and I've yet to actually cut down a tree that didn't belong to me. There's no real reason to. Thank you. Okay, Council, seeing no further questions, Mr. M Mr. Mickleberry, thank you. Uh, I will call the hearing closed, uh, and I will ask Mr. Coates to uh, put on the screen for Council and the public uh, the motion that we would consider at this time. Now I will look for a mover. Thanks. Moved by Councillor Coleman. Is there a seconder? Thanks. Seconded by Councillor Lucas. I'll go to the mover and seconder first to speak, and then I'll look for other speakers. Uh, Councillor Coleman. Thank you, and thank you all for coming out. <clears throat> this is... Um, always a fascinating process to go through. There's lots of emotion, whatever one's perspective. Um, and this has been presented as council, we'd like this option or we'd like that option. <clears throat> Either the two house option, ideally with secondary suites or garden suites, and I'll get into that in a second, or the three house option, which wouldn't have any uh, suites at all but would have more parking. Um, so this has generated lots of correspondence um, and some particularly passionate perspectives. Um, there, first of all, let's deal with precedent. If you go down the street, people said this will just set a precedent, we'll see more of this sort of thing. On this block or the, the map that we've got, it's the only double wide frontage that we have on the street. Um, so you won't get three applications coming in anywhere else unless people buy two lots and put them together. It's always an option, and, and I understand the concern that goes with that, but I don't think it sets the same precedent. <clears throat> um, people, I think sometimes when we use the legal designation of small lots, it scares people because it's change that they don't want to see. 33-foot frontages in Fairfield, and one gentleman from uh, James Bay referenced, you don't want to change the nature of Fairfield. There are about, I'm told, about 200 similar-sized lots. Recognize that a small lot in Fairfield, or a small lot by this application, would be a minimum of 2,800 square feet. The smallest of these three is just over 3,800 square feet, so it's significantly bigger. Um, and there are about 200 of those in Fairfield, and we don't go down the street and designate them in our minds as small lots. We say, oh, there's a home. So it's how we embrace these two options and try and delineate. First of all, as I said, that the two home option, or the two house option, wouldn't guarantee us secondary suites, <clears throat> but there would be an option for it. They also wouldn't guarantee us garden suites and those would need rezonings anyway, so the developer couldn't just walk in tomorrow and ha build two larger houses and guarantee garden suites because they'd have to go back through public hearings. Now that may change, we may actually designate that or delegate that to staff, but we're not there yet. Um, so as we try and delineate between the two, I ask a different question, and it's how many bedrooms are there? And the reason that becomes important, it's about giving options for families. And what we've seen over the history since the 1970s, we've seen lots of growth in Fairfield, but family numbers or, or the people in the houses, the numbers are going down. 
So the population of Fairfield hasn't grown dramatically because we haven't, we've seen lots of young families have the kids grow up and leave. So if you had two houses and secondary suites, you might get six bedrooms. You might get more. But in these three applications, we've got nine bedrooms because there's an option for three master bedrooms and each of the houses having two subsidiary bedrooms. That tends to reflect a greater option for families. So if I try and balance between these, and there's been, as I say, lots of discussion and we've had lots of backward and forward, a couple of things that you need to keep in mind or we need to keep in mind. When people say we prefer the two house option with garden suites or secondary suites, there's another group of people who live in Fairfield who say, we hate garden suites. We don't want to see them in the neighborhood. So we try and balance between those. The fact is, I'm, I'm a fan of garden suites. If I had my druthers for this, if I were to say, which option would I like? I probably like the two house option as long as I could guarantee that there would be garden suites with it. But I can't do that. So I have to take a look at what's here and I then say, the application in front of us does a number of things. One, the lot sizes are bigger than we would normally consider in secondary or in small lot rezonings. Um, the variances are actually pretty minor. There are two four inch variances in terms of setbacks and they're internal to the, the building, which means, or internal to the three lots, which means they only affect the center building. Um, there is parking provided. That's not always the case in these things, and particularly with secondary suites and garden suites, there doesn't have to be uh, parking allocated. And I think it's important that we take a look and say, where does this fit in the housing continuum? And this is, uh, I think these three options do lend themselves to families. Affordability is, is an issue um, that we will always discuss, and this doesn't affect or isn't an option that will be available to the first or second quintile in, the, in household incomes in Victoria. It probably would be available to the third and fourth quintile. So as you go up, our, our lowest income earners are at about $18,000 a year in the, the first quintile. The second quintile goes up to about 30 k They're not going to be able to afford to buy these. There may be a rental option, I suppose. Um, but it gets into that third quintile and the fourth quintile that probably will be the purchasers of these. So if it fits that threshold, that it can work, I then have to look at the architecture on the street. Looking at the way these are articulated, they're not going to be the preference of everybody, but do they fit on the street? I think they do. So on the balance, here's an application I might prefer, if I were the developer, I might prefer to go with the two-house option if I could guarantee garden suites because I like those over secondary suites but I can't guarantee that. So I then take a look at what's here and I think on the balance of probabilities I can support it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to Councillor Lucas, then Councillor Isaac, and then myself, and then I'll look for others, then Councillor Young, Councillor Madoff. Okay, Councillor Lucas, go ahead as a seconder. Thank you. And thank you everybody for coming out this evening. Um, the couple of people that spoke uh, tonight about um, uh, wanting to stay in their neighborhoods, needing to downsize, not wanting to go to condominiums. That really resonates with me because we, we do have to find a way to exist in our neighborhoods. We have to find new ways of um, finding ways that um, we can accommodate everybody's needs. Um, the issue of affordability is, and I agree with the young lady that spoke, um, it is scary. It's very scary out there. But there is no way that we can control the affordability in this situation, in this neighborhood. I mean, those two houses could be $2 million each, and the rental suites could go for $2,500 uh, a month. That's not affordable. Uh, we can't control that. We can't control that these houses, the three of them, will be $1.3 million. Maybe they'll be. 1.8 million, I don't know. So I don't know that we can judge this on being an affordable or not. I, for me, I, I want to take a look at, at uh, uh, Councillor Coleman spoke to this, the, um, the parking. 
uh, which is always one of the biggest things we hear in these neighborhoods, be and James Bay and Fairfield, is um, finding places, how do we accommodate them on the streets? These ones are going to be taken care of. Um, they're not going to be on the street. Uh, there isn't a lot of uh, variances requested. Uh, it, they're very small. Um, and um, I think that keeping the existing home uh, I, I, you know, is it a hair, you know, is it a, a valuable, I don't really know, but uh, that seems to be a, an issue in these neighborhoods that we don't just tear down these uh, homes, that we try to keep them, uh, and there's the ability for that to happen. So uh, I will listen to what the rest of my colleagues say here, but um, at this point, I, I think that uh, I'm prepared to accept the, the uh, application. Thank you, Councillor Lucas. Councillor Isaac. Uh, yeah, um, I don't support the uh, the motion on the floor. Uh, I think if there was strong or even moderate support on this block of Moss Street among the people who already live there, uh, I could be inclined to support it. Um, if uh, there was even substantial opposition on the block, but these units or these uh, this project was going to contribute uh, in a substantial way to housing affordability, I could consider supporting it. Um, but since neither of those sort of conditions are met, there's opposition, strong opposition, uh, based on the people who live there. Um, and really, this is high-end housing. I'm not an economist, Councillor Young is, but I think uh, this is, these units or these uh, dwellings would only be available or accessible to the highest income quartile or quintile. Um, in terms of new construction, uh, the quality of finishings that would likely be installed. Uh, this, this is the type of housing where there's no shortage in our community. Where there are acute shortages is single family homes uh, less than $600,000 and uh, rental housing units less than $1,500 per month. Uh, it's certainly challenging for market actors to provide that kind of housing, but the fact is that's where the shortages are, uh, not in housing priced where either three dwellings on the, this lot would be or where there are two dwellings. Um, so since the project doesn't contribute to housing affordability and in the face of I think what you could fairly describe as a wall of opposition uh, from people living uh, you know, on this part of Moss Street, um, I can't support it. It seems that the comments in favor, uh, there are a, two, two speakers I believe who live on Moss, spoke in favor, but otherwise the speakers who support the project don't actually uh, live right on the block and they won't be uh, immediately impacted. So uh, for that reason, I can't support it. Thank you, I have myself next. I am really struggling with this one um, and I'll get to the crux of it in a moment. I just, I want to go back to, the, to a question for staff about this building permit. So say we turn this down and the developer says, okay, well, I'm going to build those two houses that the neighbors have said they want. Does staff have any, could they come in and build two big flat roofed modern looking buildings on that street? Does staff have any control? Um, staff has, has no control over the form and character of these two buildings. Okay, thanks. Yeah, form and character, those are the words I was looking for. Well, I'm, I'm going to listen to my colleagues, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm a bit of a control freak. Uh, and I think in this instance, we have control over what's being proposed here. Um, it's maybe not ideal, um, and we have heard from some neighbors who feel that way. I lived on Moss Street. Um, I can't remember the address, but it was uh, very close, one block from the ocean. I lived. That was one of the first places I lived in Victoria. So I'm very familiar with this with this block and with this area. And I picture myself not driving along the street, as as one of the um, neighbors said, but walking along the street. And I kind of squint and close my eyes and think, okay, I'm walking. I see these two, three, uh, these sorry, these three houses. Um, one is an old house. It's it's rotated. Um, the two have slanted roofs. There's they, they really they've tried I think to fit in. 
um, and then you know imagining what could be there if we turn this down and I, and I don't want to peddle in fear I don't think that's useful but I'm trying to imagine we have control tonight we could approve these three houses that fit with the form and character or we could turn it down and let the developer or whoever else do what they want and we have no control no one has any control of, of what is built there so that is that's the fundamental uh, issue that I'm struggling with and so I'm, I'm leaning towards uh, with the work that's gone into these seeing the three houses built uh, as opposed to surrendering control and hoping for the best with two uh, two other houses um, so I guess I'll leave it at that and, and listen to uh, to my colleagues. Um, the issue of affordability, I think it is very, very unfair to cast that issue on this project. Um, the reason I asked the question I did during the question, question period time, uh, we can't make people build secondary suites. Um, now that's something I think that we can take up maybe in this housing affordability crisis maybe we can and this is a question for our staff for another time if you want to build a new house in Victoria maybe we do say and you have to build a secondary suite I mean maybe that's a policy direction that council can can put um, but we don't have that direction right now I, I Mr. Tinney would that be possible I mean, it's not a simple wave of a wand, but it, you know, a, a new single-family dwelling is an is a entitlement conferred on a developer. Is there a policy or a bylaw um, that the council could put in place to request a secondary suite or garden suite uh, every time a new single-family dwelling is built, depending on the lot size? Uh, we'd have to look into that. I think there may be some provisions that, uh, that, that look at that, although there may, be some, there may also be some opportunities through, in, through incentive as well. Um, but um, certainly that's something that we could look at through, uh, through part of the secondary suite con considerations. Great. Okay, so we'll flag that for future follow-up because I agree we need more secondary suites. We need more rental housing, but I don't think it's fair to say this project doesn't do that because this council hasn't asked that of any developer at this point. So I think that's certainly something that I'll follow up with in the future. So I guess at this point I'll cede the floor. I'm leaning toward approving for the reasons that I've stated, which is that we have some control tonight on what will go on those three lots um, and no control uh, if we just say, you know what, we're turning this down and we'll hope for the best. Um, I'll leave it at that and I'll go to Councillor Young, Councillor Madoff, and then Councillor Loveday. Uh, I'm, I'm not able to, to support this. Um, just to um, respond to, to some of the concerns, um, it is true that with a new single family houses, uh, we don't exercise design control, but uh, our zoning has inherent in it a whole lot of controls in terms of uh, building heights, setbacks, um, things basically designed to uh, prevent houses from overwhelming their, their neighbors or, or blocking uh, sunlight to an undue degree or covering too much of the lot and so forth. So. Um, so far, it is absolutely true that we have not uh, attempted to actually um, dictate the style or design of houses. And um, frankly, I, I think we have to allow um, people to, to choose the, the kind of house uh, they want to live in. Um, I'm certainly not conf confident enough in my design skills uh, to tell everybody else um, that they have to live in a house that I like or, um, or that uh, one of our advisory panels likes. Um, the, uh, oddly enough, um, Councillor Coleman and I were thinking along the same lines when we I think we both looked at the at the map of the neighborhood, and um, looked at the the lot sizes, and um, were I think we both um, anticipate the same kind of reaction, and I think uh, we have different reactions to that reaction. Um, that is, once you say to people. This is the standard of density that we are prepared to allow, then you will get exactly what Councillor Coleman suggested would happen. Um, two neighbors will say, 
uh, gosh, if we got together and moved one of these houses 20 feet over toward the lot line, we could create a new lot in between. Or um, a developer buys two lots together and one of the old houses in pretty, is in pretty bad shape and he says, okay, well, I'll knock down one of them, move the other one a little bit and then I can have two, uh, two extra lots. And the fact is, um, the, the, with, with uh, lot values the way they are in this neighborhood, um, that's the kind of reaction I think uh, we might see. Um, is that a good thing or not? I think that one of the things that makes people happy is they live in a house because they want to live in a house, not because they bought it with the idea that it's going to, they're going to figure out some way to manipulate um, the neighbors in the neighborhood to allow them to spin off another lot or that they live in a house because they like to live in the house, but they're worried that their neighbors are going to want to do that kind of thing, or that people are always knocking on their doors saying, I have an idea for how we can manipulate these uh, lots in order to uh, create a new lot. Um, yes, the very fact that these, these small lots are valuable does tell us something about the market, um, and uh, I'm certainly not always hostile to the idea of, of smaller lots, and, and certainly there are lots of circumstances where that may be a good thing to do. But I, I just think that all neighborhoods don't have to be the, the same. Somebody pointed out very astutely um, that I used to live in James Bay on a very different kind of street with different lot widths and different kinds of housing. And now I happen to live in a neighborhood in Fairfield that has a much greater degree of uniformity, uh, but still providing uh, a lot of housing. A lot of people have basement suites or there's a, 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 a health care facility down the street housing a number of um, people, for example. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of different uh, ways that people live. But I, I just don't think I want to get into a situation where people are taking advantage of this small lot rezoning, which does have a place to basically produce a constant uh, churn and upheaval in our neighborhood, trying to figure out ways uh, to um, uh, subdivide lots or, or figure out ways to um, combine lots and resubdivide them in order to create um, new smaller lots. I, I think uh, the neighborhood has been in this general format uh, for a century. Um, I think the idea of, of uh, two houses that are on the same size lot as everybody else's is quite reasonable. Um, but I don't think that, uh, particularly in a case where the two most affected neighbors uh, are not supportive, uh, that we should be, be pushing ahead uh, with this uh, kind of uh, uh, rezoning. Thank you very much. I have Councillor Madoff next. Thank you, and thank you very much for everyone who came out this evening and for your patience uh, sitting through our deliberations. Um, Any time that we consider a rezoning, I'm always very mindful that, um, by my definition, a rezoning is a privilege, and that we need to give very special care and attention to each one that we consider, uh, and the perhaps the advantages or principles that are espoused in a rezoning that would uh, make it seem supportable or of value to the neighborhood. So when looking at this one in the context of the, the small lot rezonings that we, we look at quite often, one of the things that uh, we consider is the value of the retention of an existing building. And oftentimes what we see is that there may be an existing building that is not in uh, first class condition, 
And the, the sort of the trade-off or the, the, the quid pro quo is that that house is actually restored, brought back to uh, playing the role that it had played previously on the streetscape in terms of its rehabilitation, and then a new infill building put in beside it. And with this one, I think it's, it, we need to be really clear, this is not a restoration, it's not a rehabilitation. It's reorienting the house on the lot, basically stripping the inside of it and altering the outside in terms of its finishes and orientation in a way that it will no longer be recognizable as the house that it once was. So we have to question what is the value of that retention in and of itself, other than perhaps some degree of recycling of material when the interior of the house is, is stripped down to the studs and the studs are, are still retained. So in this application, that's, that's one benefit that I'd be looking for that I, that I don't see. The, um, the notion in the beginning of the presentation that, that really the approach to this site has to do with uh, accommodating population growth. And um, the reason that I asked that question, I was just a bit puzzled because, as has been pointed out, a building permit could have been applied for that if uh, the, the true motivation for this project was um, accommodating population would have been for two single family homes with secondary suites. So I'm a little bit at odds. I just can't understand if, if that's really the driving principle behind this. It's not the restoration and rehabilitation of an existing house either. Then what are we really accomplishing by um, approving three small lot houses in and of, them, you know, in and of themselves? Um, it's been said we can't make the developer or the owner, um, we can't force them to put in secondary suites. But you know what we can do, and I think what's really important is that we can send the message and we can create the potential for that to happen. Because if we approve what we're looking at this evening, the one thing we know for sure is that there will not be a diversity of housing. There will not be secondary suites. And looking at the housing market as it currently exists, seeing the new houses that are being built, seeing how so many of them have secondary suites because that's what the market is looking for, it's a gamble that I'm absolutely willing to take. And I know that um, we should really just stay away from using the term affordable in any of our discussions. There's really nothing affordable in Victoria unless it's subsidized housing. So I'm not expecting a project to create affordable housing, but what I find in terms of demographics is that it's the secondary suites where we're seeing families. And it's even the garden suites. In this area, I know a family of four living in a garden suite. So, and if we want diversity of our neighborhoods, if we want to support the local schools, then we have to provide opportunities for that kind of accommodation uh, to be provided. The R1S2, I usually prowl around after they're built, and as I said a number of times in public hearings, I would love to be proven wrong on this, but we're often told that the R1S2, the small lot house, is going to provide housing for families. And I'm still looking for the R1S2 house that does have families with children in them. I think as we heard this evening, it's a very um, appealing housing type for, for, um, for singles or older couples who are downsizing, but I have yet to see it being identified as a really desirable form of housing for families, young families or, or growing families as well. The thing that I think we need to remember, and again, I think I spoke to that, the, 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 this principle this morning, is that, uh, and talking about the, the, the the properties that have sold on the street, is that we send very strong messages when we rezone. And we play a very direct role in the escalation of property values. And what we can be sort of guaranteed of is that it's going to continue to um, result in very high-end housing as a result. We may not create legal precedents, but we certainly pave the way for that kind of approach. So when I look at this, I'm looking at does it deliver on any of the principles that are espoused in the small lot zoning? One of the main principles is to, to provide stabilization of neighborhoods that are at threat, under threat. This neighborhood is not under threat. So for me, a small lot rezoning truly is a, pr a privilege 
and that we need to look very carefully at what the benefits will be. As I said earlier, often it results in the rehabilitation of an existing building on the site as the, as the quid pro quo for the, um, for the rezoning itself. So I'm not going to be able to support this application. I'm willing to take a risk that um, that we could we would actually see two single family homes here with uh, secondary suites because that's just what makes sense from a development point of view, from a real estate point of view, from a neighborhood point of view as well. We certainly can't touch on the issue of affordability, but we can go a long way in, in sending a strong message about the importance of diversity in our neighborhoods and the importance of diversity in the types of housing that is made available. Thank you. Thank you. I have Councillor Loveday and then Councillor Alto, and then I will uh, call the question since we've all speaking, spoken. Councillor Loveday. Yeah, first off, thanks to uh, everyone who came out and, and spoke uh, and shared their opinions about this proposal. Um, it's great to have your, your input here tonight. Um, I'm, I'm not able to support this at this time. I, I don't think it meets the threshold of neighborhood support, and specifically the most impacted neighbors. Uh, I think I, I can't vote in favor of a, of a project that has uh, this much opposition unless it's lending some community benefit, some greater benefit uh, would compel me to, to perhaps vote uh, in a way that I think that the, if I thought the project would benefit the greater community, even though it might negatively impact some of the most immediate neighbors. I, I don't think that's the case here. Um, I, am I was close to supporting. It was, it was right, on, right on the edge uh, for me. Um, but I do, I'm compelled by the idea that uh, with the existing entitlement that you could build two houses with, with uh, other suites that would create more of a diversity of uh, housing stock. When when this came to the committee, I uh, there was much discussion about affordability, and and I made a point of saying that I don't think we can ask developers uh, to come forward with affordable projects unless it's in our policy, and we need to compel developers to bring affordable affordability, uh, put affordability into their projects by doing that through our policy and through incentives. Um, but one thing that I heard tonight from one of the speakers that really I found compelling was that said. Uh, don't think of, uh, don't, my notes are really poorly scribbled, but don't, uh, like, don't densify for, for profit, densify for the diversity of a neighborhood. And thinking about what, what could we, what could happen in this space um, if there was two houses with rental suites and who could move into this neighborhood? Uh, I did bike down there the other day just to check it out and make sure that I knew exactly uh, what the lot looked like. And with, with all of this information, I, I'm not able to support it today. Councillor Alto. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, like everyone else, I thank you for coming out tonight. I know that this has been um, a really thoughtful process for all of you, and I, I appreciate the time you've put into it. And to try and help us uh, struggle through one, which I think, as you can tell from our comments, has, has been just that, a struggle. Uh, for me, there's a couple of uh, easy things to support in this, uh, as Councillor uh, Lucas referred to earlier, the fact that there is adequate off-street parking is obviously a, a bonus that we uh, often look for. And uh, the notions of retaining the existing home, despite the variations in their retention, has been pointed out by Councillor Madoff, I still think is a benefit from the perspective of the notion that we always strive to think that it's environmentally better to retain a home even if it's reconstructed rather than just throw it away and start over. So I think that's a good thing. I do have some concerns around uh, the loss of trees and the changes to the uh, environment, uh, the landscaping area. You know, although my questions were answered, I'm still not entirely confident that um, I'm certain of who owns exactly what and what exactly is going to happen from the landscaping. So I do have some concerns about that. But I guess the, the point for me that uh, is, is the most challenging to grapple with is this whole notion of diversity and choice. And as I listened to my colleagues tonight talk about diversity and the fact that these potentially three homes don't provide diversity, I kept hearing that they did. And when I kept hearing that there are you know, folks who talk about eloquently tonight and through very, very many of the emails that we re received who talk about the opportunity to find homes that reflect 
the evolution in their lives. And when they start redefining their families from the time when they were young and they had kids that were growing up and then their kids got older and their kids left, and oftentimes you have folks who are sitting in big houses they can't afford. And they're looking for opportunities like this when they still want a single family home. They don't want to move into a condominium. And they don't want to be in a secondary suite. And they want to have the privilege of living in a single family home, but one that it's smaller. And whether it's smaller because it's affordable, which I don't think is the case in almost anywhere in Victoria, as people have said, or whether it's smaller in the sense that they can just live comfortably in a smaller space. As we start grappling with the whole notion of, of smaller homes, tiny homes, different types of homes, I think that is diversity, and I think that does bring a different look to communities. And one of our, uh, one of our emails that we received earlier today talked about uh, you know, this development making the neighborhood less enjoyable, less enjoyable as a place to raise families and, and uh, less able to maintain independence and less able to allow you know, older folks to age in place. And I actually think exactly the opposite. That I think that these opportunities allow all of those things to happen. The issue of affordability is huge and it's not one that's addressed by this application in my view. In fact, it's not addressed by very many applications except for those circumstances when we demand it. And like many of my colleagues, I think we need to demand it more often. But that's not necessarily a consideration in my head for this application tonight. And I actually look at these three homes as having the ability mm -hmm. to accommodate mm -hmm. three different types of families. And I think that's a good thing. And so while I struggled with this, I will be able to support it moving ahead tonight. OK, well, with that, I will call the question. Uh, all of those in favor of this application? One, two, three, four. All of those opposed, one, two, three, four. On a tie, it fails. All right, Council, we will take a short recess and we'll return in five minutes to move on to Section F of the agenda, which is requests to address Council Part 2. And I'll ask for people who are in the gallery to settle or leave and for councillors to return from the back, although we do have a bare quorum here. So um, we are in the second section of the requests to address council. Um, we do have one late request to add, which was on my blotter at the beginning, but I missed it. So if we could have a motion, actually I'll just make a motion to add John Tiley. Uh, as a speaker, seconded by Councillor Coleman with a nod. Okay, I, I actually moved at your seconding. You yes, I'm just going to add him first and then we'll move them all. Um, thank you. All of those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, thanks. Now, would you like to move all the requests? Thank you. Uh, moved by Councillor Coleman. Uh, is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Thornton Joe. Thank you. All of those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. It is a very empty chambers considering the long list of people we have here, so I'll call them out one at a time and see how we do. Uh, and I will go back to the people who were not here earlier. Yes, Councillor Lucas. Okay, good. All right, uh, so the first speaker in this section is Chris Luby. Is Chris here? No. Okay, uh, next speaker please, Molly Cameron. Okay, and after that, uh, Jane Raman. Okay, uh, is uh, Jacinth Tremblay here? Ah, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And I think you were here earlier when you, did you hear me explain five minutes? The, okay, very good. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks okay. very much. We started. Good evening, Mayor and Council. First, I want to thank you for recommending back in July that the applicant, and we're talking about uh, Mr. Cole's application for the development at Cook and Oliphant. So that's why I'm out here. So you did back in July um, uh, that the applicant shall meet with the neighbors to discuss the Cook and Oliphant project. Unfortunately, the three meetings we did have did not solve the main concerns which are the height and the integration of the building, as mentioned, 
in the bill, as mentioned in the council's motion that you had. And that motion, just to refresh your memory, was that the application be referred back to staff to work with the applicant to address the concern expressed by neighborhood, including height and integration of the building. So in your discretion, does the proposal address what the council asked Mr. Cole to revise as far as the height and the integration of the building in Cook Street Village? In our opinion, myself, my husband, my neighbors on Elephant Avenue, Park Boulevard, and broader uh, Cook Street Village, we don't think so. Any new development should enhance, not harm, the character of Cook Street Village. Not should it harm the character and the livability of Oliphant Avenue. It's a small avenue, but it will be very affected. Now, I have attended two sessions on the local area uh, planning, community engagement process for Fairfield, and it was very clear that the vast majority of community members do not want five or six story building. Four story was the maximum. I do applaud you to allow this process, but now we're told that our input cannot be considered, that eventually it will go into a long-term plan, while in the main term, rezoning and projects are being approved. This would be too late to save the Cook Street Village. So I'm asking you, so what's the point for us to participate in these meetings if our concerns are completely in your. This is very frustrating and disapp disappointing. I must say that I'm losing trust and confidence in all those processes, but I was very impressed at the beginning. Why should you approve something that will negatively impact Cook Street Village forever? Any new development should fit the scale and the character of the area. So I respectfully request that you reject the applicant's proposal. That's it. Thank you for the opportunity to voice my concern. Thank you very much for coming to do so. Uh, next speaker, please, is Jeffrey Smith. Uh, then Mary Lagan. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on this issue. Um, at the beginning, uh, shortly after the July meeting, um, I passed Len Cole on the street talking to one of the councillors and I asked him where he was in the application process and he said it's going to public hearing because OCP is overarching and he indicated something like this. Interlaced his fingers and everything else is below it and I disagreed. I think that um, Council of the Whole exercises discretion as a statutory decision maker and that such discretion is unfettered. It's certainly not fettered by OCP. Len Cole asked me if I had some specific concerns and where it, uh, about my home, which is adjacent, and um, where it is in the building, and I told him, I haven't heard anything. I am aware that there have been discussions. He said, if I lose density, I have to pick it up somewhere else. It will not work if the fifth story is removed and there is no commercial. I am not prepared to give more away, and from an earlier discussion, I've donated time. Now, the motion of July 14 reads that the application be referred back to staff to work with the applicant to address the concerns expressed by the neighbourhood, including height and integration. Mr Tinney, in his report, uh, confirms that height hasn't been addressed, and Mr. Cole has explained why. And the sticking point really is whether OCP creates positive rights and whether directions from the 14th of July have to be taken seriously. It's not OCP that overarches, but principles of administrative law and local government act that overarch OCP. And local government act says that section 478, an official community plan does not commit or authorize a municipality regional district or improvement district to proceed with any project that is specified in the plan. So briefly, the scheme is that the city must set out a process and adhere to it 
but must retain discretion as statutory decision maker. And then under principles of um, administrative law, because the law uh, requires statutory power to be exercised by the very person upon whom it has been conferred, there must necessarily be some limit on the extent to, um, to which the exercise of discretionary power can be fettered by the adoption of an inflexible policy. Um, by law number 12013 um, uh, enacts OCP 2012, and um, the, it says at the start on the front, front page, the document entitled OCP Plan April 2012 and its associated appendices, maps, schedules, tables, and figures, all attached to Schedule A to this bylaw and made a part of this bylaw, is hereby designated as the OCP. And Appendix A of that document um, at DPA 5, Development Permit, Permit Area 5, addresses Cook Street Village, and particularly as to guidelines, it's, it says these guidelines are to be considered and applied. So that's mandatory. And it specifically refers to Cook Street Village Guidelines 2003, which say Cook Street Village extends along five blocks of Cook Street. The north half, Oscar to Oliphant, has a commercial character, etc., etc., and its CR 3M zoning provides for the for the option of commercial, residential, or mixed use. The south half, Oliphant to Leonard, flanks Beacon Hill and is residential in use and zoning. And that's really where the conflict seems to lie in trying to resolve what's going on here. Um, the height is not really um, necessarily a conflict because um, the wording for that development permit area says under section 5A3, buildings are encouraged to have a three to five story facade. Nevertheless, advisory design panel minuted concerns about height and massing and horizontal design and building materials. And the current plans show a building which is 16 to 70 meters in height. So about twice the height of the condominium building next door, which I live in, and far higher than any of the heritage buildings around it. It's a statement building. It doesn't fit. I'm asking that Council of the Whole's exercise of discretion today be consistent with its exercise of discretion on 14th July 2016, because to decide height doesn't matter anymore, and nor does integration. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to stop you there because it's five minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please, is Wayne Houlihan. No, Wayne. Uh, next, then, uh, Ashley Abraham. Uh, Crystal Mighty. Okay, I'm going to go to John Tiley. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council, staff. My name is John Tiley. I live at 1014 Park Boulevard, which is about 17 meters from the proposed development. I appreciate this opportunity to talk because I know how very precious your time is at this time of night. Each of you have had emails from me regarding the proposed Cook Oliphant development. I know you've all read them with a tremendous amount of care, so I won't repeat myself. I need to say something that was left unsaid at the Committee of the Whole this morning. You voted then to send Cook Oliphant to public hearing because, to quote several councillors, we haven't heard from the community. But the city has most definitely heard from the community. A total of six hours of robust deliberation among three groups of over 50 people each, facilitated by two out-of-town experts. I'm referring to three sessions of the Fairfield Gonzales local planning area, local area planning, excuse me, effort over the last month. We, we sent a letter to planning staff to make sure details of these sessions 
were included in their briefing for today's agenda item. But bizarrely, my word, not planning departments, bizarrely, there is a rule that prohibits them from sharing what they know with councillors in this type of situation on a timely basis. Councillor Coleman was present at some of these sessions and you heard him say this morning that he expected the public hearing to be, I think the quote is, very lively. Had he been more forthright, he would have described three sessions where a clear majority of people were strongly opposed to the type of building proposed for Cook Oliphant. And one consultant at the beginning of the session gave a, a presentation on the types of buildings that help villages succeed. They did not look in the least like the proposed development. To say you have not heard from the community denies the hours that over 100 people over the last month have put into telling the city exactly what they want and don't want. The other consultant presented a list of 130 different pictures of types of developments and they asked each of the people to divide them into the types of buildings they would like to see in their Cook Street village. And the ones that came up tops looked nothing like the proposed development. If you want to find out what the people want in Cook Street Village, you don't need a public hearing. You just need to get detailed reports of the consultant's findings. If you do decide to go the public hearing route, I most strongly urge you to ensure that the consultant's full reports are included in the record. Ideally, the consultants themselves should be asked to testify. But public hearing is not the best way to go. As I understand it, and I confess I don't fully understand it, it can end up with only one of two outcomes, both undesirable. A developer who has lost time and money, partly through lack of clarity from the city, or a village permanently scarred by a totally inappropriate development. There must be a better way to go. There are plenty of smart people in this room and lots of political will. Is there not a way to design a process whereby the developer gets some sort of guarantee about the amount of mass he can put into the building and then there's a dialogue with the community, the LAP consultants, how best to put that amount of mass into Cook Street Village in a way that enhances and not diminishes the village. The solution that that process would create can provide a template for resolving many of the other clarification issues councillors referred to this morning. I respectfully ask you to provide a creative win-win solution to this issue. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I believe that brings us to the end of our speakers. Uh, is anyone who's here signed up to speak in advance and hasn't been called? Okay, so we're not going to go back through the list from earlier then. Uh, we will move on to section G uh, of the agenda, uh, which is unfinished business. Uh, and we have two letters here uh, for, uh, to be received for information. So Mr. C okay, moving both for receipt then. Um, is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Lucas. Uh, any need to pull any of them? Okay, thanks. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, any opposed? Thanks. And just for the public, it was a letter from the Ministry of Families, Children and Social Development acknowledging receipt of our letter. And so too from Minister of Forests, Lands and Natural Resources, uh, a letter to us uh, about Emily Carr House. Uh, so Mr. Coates, we're now on and Council. Uh, report from Committee of the Whole uh, from November the 3rd. And I'm going to ask Mr. Coates to walk through the items for us one at a time. Mr. Coates. Uh, first is uh, giving consideration to three readings to the proposed uh, amendments to the cannabis business regulation bylaw when the bylaws come forward to council subsequently. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Moved by Councillor Thornton Joe. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor uh, Coleman. Uh, discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. 
Next is uh, supporting the protection, protecting children from pornography exposure motion M47. Okay, thank you. Moved by Councillor Thornton Joe. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Lucas. Discussion? Uh, yeah, Councillor Thornton Joe is the mover, and then I'll go to Councillor Loveday. Uh, th thank you, Council. Just uh, quickly, um, I know we didn't discuss it at Committee of the Whole, it was on the consent agenda. Uh, this motion comes from the uh, Victoria Family Court and Youth Justice, uh, which is a CRD committee, which uh, I sit as the Council uh, representative. At our last meeting, we had a, rep a, a speaker come and talk about the issue of pornography and the effects of pornography on youth and the fact that the last time any report was done on pornography was in 1985 um, where a special committee on pornography and prostitution uh, the Fraser committee uh, did a report and and the speaker mentioned that that report was done before the invention of World Wide Web and he um, showed how in today's with the internet and and social media, how uh, someone, uh, youth could be playing a video game and something could pop up the screen and say, would you like to see a picture of me? And a, a youth being curious might press yes, because it says yes or no. And then it will say, are you over 18 or under 18? And a youth would probably say, tell the truth and go towards the under 18 and they think, no, I want to know what's in the picture. And they find that uh, they tend to go to over 18 and they uh, get exposed to um, all types of uh, uh, pornography. Um, the evidence has shown that much of the, the pornography that is accessible, especially to youth, is shows uh, um, uh, degrading uh, actions on women and children, uh, and boys as well. Um, it affects uh, body image and self-esteem for young girls, and it has become almost an addiction uh, to, to many young boys, to the point that there is a documentary being shown at the Vic Theatre on Saturday night called Over 18, a documentary about porn. So uh, what the Victoria Youth Council has asked is not that we um, support the report's uh, findings, which hasn't been done yet, but that we support motion M47, which basically states that the Standing Committee on Health be instructed to examine the public health effects of the ease of access and viewing of online violent and degrading sexual explicit material on children, women, and men, recognizing and respecting the provincial territorial jurisdictions in this regard, and that the said committee report its finding to the House no later than July 2017. So basically what is being asked is that we support a letter going to say that a, a, an updated report is needed. Uh, and so that is all that we are asking is that the mayor, uh, the council support the mayor writing a letter to support um, motion M47 for a report to be done. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Loveday? Yeah, I think, uh, I definitely think this study is supportable. I, I, I do think that in, since this issue is on the table that we need a broad, more broad discussion about sex and pornography and studying the facts, the effect on, on health and mental health is, is definitely needed, but what we really need is some better sex ed, sex ed, including sexual education that teaches consent, is sex positive, and ends shame that's too often connected to sex, and I think this education will create healthy sexualities. And these, these frank and open discussions we need to have with young people need to include discussions about pornography and the fact that pornography isn't real sex, it's fiction. And when young people see it, they have these, the, yes, they, they're exposed to these images and it, it changes the way they think about sex. And so we need to have these discussions. We can't just try to stop them from accessing it. It is a fact of life at this point in our in, in time, so we need to be discussing it in a more broad and healthy way. So I just think this, yes, this can be one part of it, but um, I think it's just very one very small part of it. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Next, please, Mr. Coates. And that's directing staff to report back at the next quarterly update on the implications of amending the street vendors bylaw to accommodate downtown merchants to sell wares in front of their stores. 
Can we have a mover? Thanks. Moved by Councillor Lucas, seconded by Councillor Loveday. Um, uh, staff, uh, this accompanies a motion made by Councillors Loveday and Isaac about reporting back on bicycle vending. So just for clarity, we don't need two separate reports at the quarterly update. I think this can all be rolled into one, and Mr. Coates indicated that neither would be that time-consuming to actually do. So just I'd, less work for staff to just incorporate them into one report. Okay, thank you. Further discussion on this? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thanks. Next, Mr. Coates. Uh, next is referring the uh, Centennial Square Fountain uh, to staff to report back in the context of other pending actions relating to the square. Thanks. Moved by Councillor Isaac, seconded by Councillor Lucas. Discussion? Uh, Councillor Isaac as the mover, then Lucas, then Loveday. Uh, there's been some very valuable discussion in the last, uh, I guess, in social media and also rising to some media reports, and uh, I think Council's motion uh, is appropriate. Um, there's obviously a risk of scope creep in terms of how uh, big a visioning process does the council want for this particular municipal park. Uh, but I think it is in need of a refresh. Uh, something that I think has been lost in a bit of a commentary is that the current uh, draft financial plan includes an expenditure on the fountain. So that's uh, where the discussion came from, whether we refurbish what's there or whether uh, the fountain changes in some way. A lot of the input I've heard focuses on the uh, work of art, you call it an obelisk or whatever the <laughs> heck it is in the center. Uh, people seem a little bit uh, less attached to the, the gear, or everything ranging from a little to entirely less attached to the gear structure, which has the stucco, which has already been uh, altered from its original state. Uh, so there's some creative ideas coming forward in terms of uh, how that area can function. I look forward to seeing what staff have to say. Thank you, Councillor Lucas, and then Councillor Loveday, and then I've got a few comments, having missed this at Committee of the Whole. Thank you. Um, it, it, it refers here to uh, staff to report back in the context of other pending actions. I'm wondering if we can have a time frame attached to that. Is this Mr. Soulier? Mr. Tinney? Combo? Start with Mr. Tinney. <laughs> We can, we can do harmony. Um, uh, the current public realm process, the Visual Victoria process is having some, uh, is undertaking some engagement about uh, certain aspects and visioning for the square. Uh, as well, staff are, are uh, undertaking research for a statement of significance for the, uh, for the fountain itself. Uh, so my imagine would be that uh, certain aspects of this would come back um, in different chunks for council, likely the uh, uh, report on the, uh, related to the potential designation of the fountain itself um, could come back probably within the, uh, the next month or so, uh, whereas the outcomes for the Visual Victoria process will be uh, likely occurring uh, sort of, I believe, March of 2017 uh, is when they will conclude, and there'll be some, uh, uh, some direction that will be provided out of that. Thank you. Do you have anything further, uh, Mr. Soulier, to add? Uh, Mayor Helps, just to clarify in terms of the public washroom and play feature, uh, we've uh, tentatively scheduled December 8th, I believe, to report back on those two items. Okay, great. Councillor Lucas, you still have the floor. Thank you. Do we need to have that included in this, or is this enough to have the verbal of when these time frames will come back? Uh, well, the two items, the washroom facilities and the play feature, are mm -hmm. on the agenda tracking report for December the 8th, so I think that's fine. The visual victory is a little bit looser because that process is still underway. Mr. Uh, Johnson? I think it would be appropriate for council to ask for a draft work plan so you get a chance to see what this looks like, and we can put that together along with timelines. Okay, great. So maybe a, an amendment to this to request a draft work plan? Is that appropriate? Okay. Um, maybe I'll do that when that gets to me, unless, <coughs> Councillor Lucas, you want to make that? Okay. Uh, Councillor Loveday. Yeah, I'm... Uh, I'm Supportive of the motion, I'm sending this for, you know, to do this exploration. Um, I'm wondering if, if when this comes back, or uh, I'd like to find out just about a very minimal thing to start, which is just chiseling off the the stucco, the bumpy stucco, and I, I want to know what's underneath there, um, since that was put there to make it less comfortable. So, uh, what? Maybe it looks beautiful under there. I have no clue. But, uh, but it, can we, do you know about that, or what's the process for finding out? 
Uh, Mr. Through, Soulier? Through Mayor Health, so um, our manager of facilities uh, did look into that with, with the facilities team and uh, the report that we received back was that uh, chiseling off the, uh, the stucco would actually damage uh, what's underneath the original structure. It's been, um, it's been the, the construction is such that it, it, it can't be easily removed. So we've investigated that. It's, uh, I, I mean, that's a, it's a shame, I think, you know, that it's just such a signal of uh, the type of urban design we don't want to be doing in this century and uh, in terms of making places less comfortable and less appealing to sit. That's the exact, of, exact opposite of how we're trying to design our public spaces these days. Um, one really interesting suggestion uh, just in terms of was just doing a sort of a, a gouty thing, like the, you, you know, uh, on top of it and adding some color to the, to the stucco. I, like, there's lots of ideas, I, but uh, that's, that's one I was really interested in finding out, and it's unfortunate that that would cause damage to the structure. Thank you. I've got myself next, so I'll propose the amendment um, that Mr. Johnson suggested, which is direct staff to report back to council with a draft work plan for Centennial Square. I'm moving it. Are you, do you want a second? <laughs> Thank you. Seconded. Thanks. Uh, I'll just I'll just motivate. Uh, do you want to speak on the amendment after me, Councillor Young? Okay, you're just voting or uh, putting up your hand. Um, I think uh, the fountain stimulated a great conversation, and it's generated a lot of public interest in what should be a primo public space out there. And I think probably not, to be realistic, probably not in 2017, but we will need to consider whether we're going to improve the fountain if we may change it later, spend that money, I don't think so, but that's another discussion for the budget. Uh, I think maybe in 2017, um, in preparation for the 2018 budget, we need to have uh, a conversation with the community in a really creative way in the square. And so I'd like to see that as part of the, the work plan. I bumped into Carrie Milton, um, the CEO of the Downtown Victoria Businesses Association in the square, uh, and they're getting a lot of um, uh, pressure, I think is a, a way of putting it, um, uh, for more family spaces in the downtown, and I know that's something uh, important for the Downtown Residents Association as well. And so I have, uh, you know, an imagining of a, a day-long or a two-day placemaking charrette with families and kids in the square about how do we turn that into a space that families and kids and, and, and people uh, want to come and, and use. And um, anyways, so if something like that can be considered as part of the work plan, it doesn't need to be complicated. Uh, invite people to the square <clears throat> for a day or two and, and literally place make uh, with, you know, with, with kids in mind and, and families in mind because as we build more and more condos and rentals downtown, um, that is going to become the living room and playroom for a lot of people and I think we need to take that seriously. So um, I'm glad we started with the fountain and uh, I think it stimulated interest in the public to have a bigger conversation than just the fountain. So uh, directing staff to bring us a work plan um, will hopefully accomplish that. So are there further speakers on the amendment? On the amendment? Yes, Councillor Isaac, go ahead. Yeah, I do support this. I think um, we are going to have some hard decisions when the Parks Master Plan comes back about prioritization of parks. Uh, I don't think that Centennial Square needs a major intervention, even though there may be a major debate over some particular fixtures from a cost standpoint and a capital standpoint. I think the square functions quite well, particularly the uh, westerly half where the improvements were made a few years ago. Um, I hope we don't lose sight of other major downtown improvements, including Ships Point Park, which is in the strategic plan. And uh, so I think the target for capital planning and real, really, I guess, new park improvements, I don't think is out here. But I think a refresh of some features of the square is in order, uh, along with the, the imminent uh, items to consider, like the washroom facilities. Thank you. Yeah, and just for clarity, um, sometimes with placemaking, you can make a major impact with a minor intervention. So I'm not imagining giant uh, capital projects in the square. I agree Ships Point is a higher priority in terms of capital investment, but I think there are some really creative, interesting things that we can do if we invite a diversity of people, an intergenerational uh, group of people to say, how would you like to use this square? What kinds of temporary fixtures could we add that would make it a place that you want to come after you've had lunch or, or you know, met your family after work or whatever it is. So that's, I'm not envisioning large capital expenditures. I think there's just, there's some creativity that we can call on and draw on our residents to help us with to, uh, to improve the square in the interim. Yeah, Councillor Thornton-Joe. 
Yeah, uh, th thank you. Um, I'm happy to have a draft work plan brought back. My only concern is a, a little bit of scope creep in, 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 with the recognition that the immediate need is a permanent washroom facility. So the others are how we can enhance the square and make it more um, welcoming. But the, the actual need that is not only immediate, and it was yesterday that we needed it, uh, was the permanent washroom facility. So I'm concerned uh, that any of this may slow down uh, the, the creation of the washroom. So I just wanted that said. Yeah, and just for clarity, that's certainly not the intention. Mr. Uh, Soulier on December the 8th is bringing us some recommendations with, wash, with regard to washrooms. Um, we will probably, hopefully, make a decision as to what direction to go, uh, and then we can continue uh, the discussion, the larger con conversation. So uh, for now, though, we're still on the amendment, um, directing staff to report back with a work plan. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, further discussion on the motion as amended? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Council, thanks for your indulgence for me to add a bit there since I was not here at that uh, item f last week. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, any opposed? One opposed? Okay, Councilor Young's opposed. Thank you. Uh, next, please, Mr. Coates. And that's uh, providing supportive comments to the Liquor Control and Licensing Branch for the uh, change of hours to the, the uh, liquor license for the new Asian village at Wharf Street. Any movers? Move Thanks. Moved by Councillor Thornton-Joe, seconded by Councillor Coleman. Uh, Councillor Thornton-Joe, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, at Committee of the Whole, I did uh, vote to decline it. And my reason being at the time was just uh, concerned, for one, the... A resident association, so the the DRA, uh, did mention that although they were supportive, they wanted uh, us to always consider the immediate neighbors. And we did receive two immediate neighbors, which is the regent, uh, opposing it. And so for that reason, I mentioned at Committee of the Whole that I still wanted to give it more thought. Uh, since that time, um, and, and one of the reasons I wanted to give more thought is that Wharf Street was considered an area in the past that we had some concerns of too many uh, liquor establishments that with only a few small eateries with very little seats, very little washroom facilities, and it would trickle on to the sidewalk. And we had a lot of policing issues um, in, re in regards to that. Uh, but regarding this establishment, and, and I haven't had a chance to uh, check it out, but in looking on the web and, and trying to find a little bit more, I think this is a little bit um, uh, more sit down, uh, um, full menu, um, restaurant and compared to the other ones on War Street. Uh, when I looked it up, it, it was considered, uh, it, apparently it comes from Edmonton. They've been in Edmonton for 32 years. They have 13 branches. And they, in Edmonton, they're considered the top five ethnic restaurant in Canada. Uh, so, uh, and, and they're very excited to bring their new restaurant and concept uh, to British Columbia and Victoria. So this is only what I've read on uh, the internet, but when it comes to uh, providing a culinary uh, and food option for people after bar closure, this is definitely what I would steer more towards uh, than, uh, you know, no offense to pizza establishment, but just another uh, quick um, establishment where there's not enough uh, places to sit and no washroom facilities uh, that are provided. So with that, I will be changing my vote to, to support it. It's just a, a modest increase in hours, uh, but I did want to make sure that I considered the concerns of the residents uh, before making that decision. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Thornton. Joe, any further speakers? Yeah, Councillor Lucas. I, I wanted to go back to this is a food primary. I want to make sure that I'm clear. It, it isn't actually a liquor primary. It is a restaurant. It's a food primary. Through my help, that's my understanding, yes. So they need to serve food right up until these times, the closing time, uh, in order to uh, sell liquor. Through, through your mouth, that too is my understanding, yes. Okay, thank you. You are welcome. Okay, further discussion on this one? Okay, thanks. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Next, Mr. Coates. Next is uh, waiving the clean hands policy uh, for planning approvals at uh, 121 Menzies in James Bay. Okay. Is there a mover? Thank you. Moved by Councillor Coleman. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Loveday. Uh, discussion? Okay. All those in favor? 
Those opposed? Okay, none opposed. The motion carries. Next, please. That's approving the uh, 2017 Committee of the Whole and Council meeting schedule and making that available to the public as required under the community charter. Mover. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Thornton. Joe, is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor uh, Young. Discussion? Councillor Isaac. I guess just wondering about the rationale for shifting the, uh, the schedule in August. Uh, that was uh, my suggestion. Um, it, the rest of the world uh, seems to be gone for the end of August, and uh, we have uh, there. I don't want to say c come under suspicion, but it, it, sometimes we're accused of sneaking things through uh, while everybody else is on vacation. So, in the interests of uh, full transparency and the ability to do our business when everybody else is also in town. Uh, that's the reason for taking the council break at the same time as most of the city seems to take its break. Oh, and then I guess there is that uh, before we were shut down from um, BC day on, will that be sort of a bit of a, a lame duck week? Because wouldn't there be a similar perception? A lot of the public is on holiday the first week in August, and now we would be conducting business that week. Okay. It's a little bit of a... Yeah. My, my, sure, if you want to try and make a proposed amendment, but the, the rationale is that the last two weeks of August is auto reply season. Yeah. Uh, know what people are just generally not here. Yeah. And so, the, you know. Sure, I, maybe we can experiment. Well, I guess we approve this every year, so it kind of Correct. every year is a pilot. So yeah. maybe this will be a pilot for that shift. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, next, please. And that's uh, supporting the establishment of a regional transportation service through the CRD. Oh, subject. Sorry, Mr. Coates, um, you missed the Connect Victoria app. That's receiving the uh, Connect Victoria app report for information. Thanks. Moved by uh, Councillor Coleman, seconded by Councillor Loveday. Councillor Loveday, discussion? Um, I, I, think this is, I think this is great, as we discussed last week. Um, it was brought to my attention that the app as currently developed does not work for blind people. Um, their readers do not pick up because it's all image-based. And uh, I'm wondering if we, I, I think there's some work being done to fix that, but I'm, I'm, can staff please comment? Ms. Thompson? Uh, through Mayor Helps, that has actually been fixed and it's live uh, with a new version. That's really great to hear. That it's great. Rapid uh, prototyping. Yeah, that it's, it's up and running and, and hopefully when we develop something like this in the future, it's just... It, it's just top of mind that this, this is just gets worked into all of our processes that before we launch things, we think, what are the barriers we're creating? We, we just can't be continually to creating new barriers. We have, we have to be working to dis, disassemble them. So I'm glad this was fixed so quickly. Um, I'm glad that more residents are now able to use this great app. Great. Thank you. Any further discussion on the app? Yes, Councillor Thornton-Joe. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a question. I was at the uh, Fernwood uh, Community Association meeting, and they were they, the members were already knew about it, were very excited about it, and had already uh, downloaded. Uh, but they said one of the uh, troubles they had, sorry, <laughs> my screen needs to, was that if they had there was a full garbage can, and there, and it had to have to to be able to respond to it, they had to write the exact address. And the garbage can was in an area that really didn't have an address. So, do they just do the address close by, or they want to say a corner? So, just uh, I told them I would report back on how best they give the address. Uh, through Mayor Helps, uh, right now you do have to put in an address, uh, but you can obviously put in one that is close to it if it doesn't have an exact address. We are working on uh, the another update that will actually not require you to put in an address. Obviously, it's easier to find whatever you're looking for if we can have some type of location okay. for it. But. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Councillor Loveday? you off it sounded like you were going to start talking but i was but i'll go last go ahead okay uh yeah just one comment that i wanted to share that i think was on my when i posted on facebook it was just someone commented really cool i've learned more about what's happening at city hall in the last hour than i have in the last year mm -hmm. super impressed so just that's Great. the type of impact this thank you send that quote to uh ms fallis in citizen engagement so we can use it somewhere 
Uh, that's very good feedback. Um, yeah, that my, my comment was going to be uh, there will be issues with the app. Um, that's the nature of doing something uh, new and this notion of rapid prototyping. Let staff know when you're getting comments from the public about this is working or this isn't working uh, and um, and we'll keep improving it. I mean, that's the beauty of, of the digital world is we can make it better um, very easily and very quickly. So, okay, uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thanks. Next. Next is the um, support the establishment of a regional transportation service through the CRD subject to the bylaw establishment that is satisfactory to the city. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Isaac, seconded by Councillor Alto. Discussion? Okay, all those in. Oh, yes, Councillor Isaac? Yeah, I think uh, it's good for the city to show leadership on this. There has been some debate in other municipalities, but I think for the long term, uh, uh, well-functioning of the region, but also ecological and social and economic considerations, uh, this is the way to go. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, next, please, Mr. Coates. Uh, next is directing an amendment to the uh, business regulation bylaw for uh, the cannabis-related businesses, um, uh, considering exemptions under Section 6C for nonprofit cannabis operations. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor Isaac. Discussion? Yes, Councillor Young? Well, I'm not supportive of this for reasons I outlined earlier, but I think it might be reasonable to at least clarify in the light of the speaker tonight whether it means that it has to have been operating as a nonprofit since 2009 or that it merely has to have existed since 2009 and been converted to a nonprofit after that, in which case we might find that some people who have been operating in the cannabis business in one form or another for many years might decide they want to become nonprofits and then would qualify if that's the uh, way the, uh, it's to be defined. Thanks for your generosity, Councillor Young, uh, in helping us out with something you're not going to support. No, I'm, I'm being genuine. I seriously uh, appreciate that. Um, can some of the crafters of this motion make sure we've got uh, good enough wording? Go ahead, Councillor Alto. Uh, just to, to uh, I, that's a great question. I thought of it as well when uh, one of our speakers was speaking this evening. And uh, I think the important thing about this is that what it's asking is uh, for staff to uh, do the work to come back to Council with the appropriate wording for an appropriate bylaw change. And uh, that certainly would, I have every expectation that our staff who've already raised some uh, important issues about the detail needed to clarify this, that that will be one of the clarifications. I'll look at Mr. Coates to, to confirm that. Mr. Coates? Uh, through Mayor Helps, um, certainly the, uh, the motion that, that Council is, is considering um, has nuances in it that can be very difficult to incorporate quite literally into a, in, into a regulatory scheme. So the work that staff would bring forward for Council to consider is sort of the best, um, the best possible proximity to what mm -hmm. the intent of this motion, if passed, is. And so um, there may be options around what that looks like. And certainly um, there is work for us to do to consider how to sort of get the closest fit. I, Thank you. I, I interpret that to mean that the staff will come back with their, their best attempt and that we'll have a chance to have a further discussion. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Councillor Isaac? I think it helps to have an amendment um, because essentially this, my understanding is the movers and also council wanted to catch a certain establishment and the proponent of that establishment has indicated that this wouldn't apply. So I'd like, uh, well, I think Councillor Young's point I think is a valid, valid argument. So I'm going to move that everything beginning from existing till the end of the motion would be replaced with um, non-profit cannabis operations that have no commercial purpose. Is there a seconder? No. Seconded by Councillor Young. Okay, we'll debate it. I'll go to the mover and then I'd like to speak. I think the purpose, this would be aim to avoid a shell game where a commercial operator could create a shadow or not shadow non-profit in the same establishment to circumvent this and so there's obviously a commercial benefit if you have a smoking lounge on site. So it would be challenging for staff to validate, but uh, I think this would be the goal. 
Because I think otherwise we're going to have to just be picking favorites. That Certainly Mr. Smith has had uh, an operation for several decades, a very strong track record. Um, but to avoid accusations of discrimination by newer upstarts, I think it's what type of establishments do we think would be acceptable rather than, um, than specific businesses and grandfathering by date. Um, I'm going to speak. I'm not going to support this. I think staff understand what we're trying to accomplish, and they will come back with some recommendations, at which point we can then say, does this accomplish what we want or not? But I think narrowing their direction uh, or expanding the direction, I'm not sure which one this does, uh, too much um, hamstrings staff and their ability to do what we're trying to get them to do. So, uh, yeah, Councillor Young? Uh, well, I will support the amendment because it, it certainly moves the motion in the direction of what I would find acceptable, which is an even-handed set of principles. Uh, I, I, I fear that what council may be wanting is to give preference to an individual or an individual operation. And I, I don't think that's appropriate, and I don't think it's even appropriate to be asking staff to do it if staff determines that that is not an acceptable kind of um, action for us to undertake. Okay, Mr. Coates. Thank you, uh, Mayor Helps, through you. So um, I think certainly our, our preliminary analysis on this subject um, leads us clearly around that we have to broaden the context of what this analysis is going to look like um, because I think um, if, if one were to focus very directly on 2009 and specific businesses that that's that's not an achievable outcome with with the regulation of this nature so we're going to have to we're going to have to broaden the scope of that and come back and again struggling for the right words but coming up with the closest fit to the intention behind this um, so I think there's going to be a number of possibilities that we'll probably put together that council can give consideration to um, it's, it's really not quite a a straightforward and, and and direct end result. So I think we've got we've got work to do, and, and part of the struggle of articulating that is we haven't done the work yet either. But I think just generally speaking, we do have to sort of back this off a bit to come back with um, options and, and potential directions that that meet the objective. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to call the question on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment. Uh, two in favor, those opposed, seven opposed, the amendment fails. Uh, further discussion on the main motion? Okay, all those in favor of the main motion? Any opposed? Okay, one opposed, the motion carries. Uh, we move on now to Committee of the Whole report from uh, November the 10th, earlier today, and I'm going to ask Mr. Coates to walk us through the items one at a time. First is um, authenticating the uh, parcel tax rule for the serial closed local area service. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Coleman. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Thornton Joe. Thank you. Discussion? Councillor Isaac? So, are these types of applications entirely initiated by the property owners? Through my helps, in this case, yes. Um, and so, there's a couple of different options for how local area services can be established. One is, is strictly by petition, and the other is by council initiative. This one was, was petitioned directly to council. And is, it's to create a traffic circle or some kind of a median in the middle of the cul de sac? Through my helps, that's correct. It's a, it's a traffic calming island on that street. So we get a lot of requests, for example, for speed humps. There's a woman on uh, Graham Street who's looking for a speed hump. She has a new baby and she has a four-year-old child. Could, and she's been waiting for years for the city to catch up. And who knows when we'll get there. Could the 100 residents of that block have a service to pay for their $2,000 speed hump? Um, through my helps, I think the, the short answer to the question is yes, and um, the larger context of that would be that is that, a, is that the effective mechanism to advance that sort of work? But certainly the, the funding for that is 100% on the property owner, so it, it is a, a potential for sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay. Yes. Uh, my, my preference is that the city, I think, has a strong and robust uh, program of active transportation and traffic calming. And if residents want to step forward and do this, that's fine. But I don't think this should be the only option because the logic of that is that more affluent neighborhoods would end up with very high quality traffic calming and uh, less affluent neighborhoods uh, would not have access to that type of safety and amenity. So, yeah. 
Thank so you I think much. what the strategic plan identifies neighborhood led traffic uh, plant transportation planning and uh, focus on uh, pedestrian and cycling safety is the way to go. Thank you, uh, Councillor Coleman. Of course, the flip side of that is if a community comes together and wants to pay for an amenity that they deem to be important, that then frees up some budgetary uh, capacity for the city to address other areas. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, next, please, Mr. Coates. Uh, next is receiving the uh, the CRD uh, wastewater treatment update and uh, specifically directing um, public amen amenities, including washroom facilities, um, the proposed alignment and engaging of the Fairfield and James Bay residents. Thanks. Moved by Councillor Isaac. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Lucas. Any discussion? Okay, thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thanks. Next, please. Uh, next is uh, moving forward with the uh, required bylaws on the um, undeveloped lands at Dockside Green uh, rezoning application on Tai Road. Okay, thank you. Is there a mover? Thanks. Moved by Councillor Coleman, seconded by Councillor Alto. Discussion? Yes, Councillor Madoff, and then Councillor Lucas, and then I've got something as well. Yes, again, could I ask to separate out point B, 1B? Sure. 1B is pulled. Um, Councillor Lucas? Can we separate out number 5? Yes, 5 is pulled. Okay, so 1B and 5 are out. We'll consider everything else. Uh, discussion on anything in... Anything that's not 1B or 5? Okay, seeing none, uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Young is opposed. Okay, we'll go to one. Oh, Councillor Isaac is opposed too? Okay, thank you. Uh, that carries. Uh, now 1B, we don't need a mover and seconder because it's already on the table. Um, discussion on 1B? Okay. I did have an email uh, late this afternoon from Norm Shearing uh, assuring me that he would uh, heard our comments about height and he said that before public hearing they would have that issue resolved or be able to present something to us that has more clarity. So just for Council's um, knowledge, they're, they're taking our concerns seriously and will endeavour to show us something uh, either at public hearing or before public hearing that addresses some of the concerns they heard today. So I just wanted Council to know that. Um, further discussion on 1B? Okay, all those in favour? Oh, sorry, yes, Councillor Isaac? Well, on that one, that, that's somewhat comforting, but it's also a leap of faith. So without me seeing what that commitment is, uh, I don't support this motion. I think uh, the argument that there should be greater articulation of heights... Um, oh, sorry, we have that captured. That's right, long day. <laughs> uh, uh, but that said, I do still think more work is needed before this is uh, ready. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll call the question on 1B. All those in favour? Those opposed? Three opposed. Okay, that carries. Uh, and now, Councillor Lucas, item number five. Thank you. I'll have to remove myself from these discussions. As the general manager of Hotel Rialto, this puts me in a potential conflict of interest. Thank you very much. Okay, five is moved by Councillor Loveday, seconded by Councillor Isaac. Any discussion? Okay, uh, I guess I have a question for staff. Um, are you going to need this kind of direction on every single application, or is there some kind of global direction we can give, or is there a better time than just before public hearing? When's the best time to make these kinds of interventions on an application-by-application -application basis, uh, should Council so choose? Uh, the best option would be through the, uh, through the policy discussion that we're meant to have in the first meeting in January. Um, so staff will be breaking out all the individual aspects of the short-term vacation rental issue, um, providing some pros and cons to council and asking council to provide clear direction on each, each type of issue and uh, re respective to that. Uh, that said, in the short term, there are uh, some uh, applications in this case where the, that use is a legacy use from the previous um, zone and has ca carried forward, and certainly we can... Uh, flag those as they come forward and council can provide uh, direction uh, in each of those situations. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll treat it as a case-by-case -case basis for now until this council makes a decision in terms of policy. Yes, Councillor Alto. 
Yeah, I thank you for asking that question because I have to say I, I did have a bit of trepidation about this. I do support it, but thinking that we are going to have the broader policy discussion not long from now, I'm just a bit cautious about anticipating where we're going to go with that on a blanket basis. So, you know, I, I will support this tonight, but I'm going to be very cautious in applying this type of thing until we've had a fulsome discussion in only two months. Thank you. Councillor Isaac? I think we have to respond to circumstances as they arise. And um, the fact is we are hearing from residents who live in recently built condos that there are dead zones that are being created because of this loophole. And we don't want to, um, I think, permit any more residential units to be built that could be used primarily sorry, for the sorry, commercial Sorry, sorry, uh, I just have to cut you off for a second. If this is going to turn into a general discussion, then I need to recuse myself. It's gonna, if it's going to remain specific to this proposal, then I don't. So it, it, it's fine. Sure. I'm happy to, but if... Sure, I get the rationale. Yeah, I think, uh, well, specific to this proposal, we don't want to create a dead zone at Dockside Green. And the fact is we're already hearing from residents who live right next door on the same uh, land subject to the same MDA that they want condos to be condos to house people and not uh, buildings used for the commercial purpose of providing transient accommodation. Okay, thank you. Councillor uh, Loveday on this application. It was more broad. So, okay. Uh, yeah, I think broad policy discussion can be had at the workshop. This is very f specifically focused on Dockside. It was just veering in that direction, and so I, I won't comment. I'll just say that if other projects like this come, I will make a similar motion. Sure, that's, and I think that's the direction we've just received from staff is that it's a project-by-project project basis uh, for now. Okay, thank you. Uh, on this motion with regard to this project, uh, all of those in favour? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Lucas, you can return. Uh, next, please, Mr. Coates. Um, that is directing staff to uh, prepare the necessary bylaws and uh, also giving notice for the development permit with variances on in connection with the rezoning application at 2035 Stanley Avenue. We have a mover. Thanks, moved by Councillor Lucas and a seconder. Seconded by Councillor Alto. Uh, any discussion? Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor? One, two, three, four, five. Those opposed? One, two, three, four. Okay, that will go forward to public hearing. That carries. Uh, next, please, Mr. Coates. That's giving notice for the proposed development variance permit for 1707 Haltane. Thanks. Moved by Councillor Thornton Joe, seconded by Councillor Coleman. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Next, please, Mr. Coates. Uh, next is uh, instructing staff to prepare the necessary bylaws for the um, and giving notice for the proposed development permit application with variances for 1041 Olafunt and 212 to 220 Cook Street. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Coleman. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Lucas. Discussion? Uh, yes, Councillor Thornton Joe. Uh, th thank you, Mayor. Uh, through you to um, the planning staff, uh, one of the speakers tonight uh, spoke about um, the, the meetings that were held um, to talk about um, the plans for the neighborhood, desires for the neighborhood. Uh, is there uh, an opportunity, like when will we see the, the report? Is that, will that, does that have to wait till the final report is completed or? Um, not having been able to have the opportunity, like Councillor Coleman, to attend some of them the, due to the conflict of meetings. Yeah. The, the development of the, the draft plan was, is, um, is currently scheduled for to, to come in front of Council in March um, based on the outcomes of the, this discussion. I think absolutely there is a robust discussion occurring in, in Fairfield-Gonzalez about uh, specifically about some of the issues in and around Cook Street Village. Um, I think from, uh, from staff's perspective, that's a general discussion. This is a, a more specific discussion to this application. And so the recommendation would be that uh, the feedback from the community be determined through the public hearing process. Uh, staff's recommendation on this one is based on the existing adopted policy, which is within the official community plan. Uh, that policy you know, wouldn't be changed until the, there's an opportunity to bring uh, something forward in front of council uh, as part of the local area planning process in March. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Isaac. The issue of height uh, came up in a lot of correspondence, but also from a, a delegation today. Can staff just elaborate uh, why the application 
is found to be consistent with Council's motion from July regarding addressing concerns relating to building height. Staff make recommendations for the application based on the policy. So Council provided, uh, uh, directed to uh, send the, the application back to work with the applicant um, to address a number of issues. And I think the applicant uh, chose to work from a list of, of, of specific issues sent in a letter to, to them from the, the community. Um, the intent of, of the direction from council and, and to staff was to work with them. Um, what we heard from the applicant was that um, um, that the, the five-story height um, is a requirement in order to provide some of the other amenities that uh, um, are, are being suggested within the, the development. Um, based on the fact that five stories is within the existing policy, uh, staff has have brought it forward and, and, and supported it. That said, the, the trade-off between that fifth story and any of the other amenities and, and other aspects of the application is for council's consideration. Yeah, it's, um, this is a challenging one. It, when I describe it in committee as rolling the roulette wheel at a public hearing, I think that's definitely going to be the case. I think thinking back to July, council got bombarded with communications from Fairfield residents, primarily opposed. And based on that input, council felt that um, uh, reining in the height uh, would have value in terms of uh, a potentially successful outcome following a public hearing. So I guess we haven't been bombarded in the same way. That may indicate that the changes have, uh, have addressed the concerns of a segment of Fairfield residents. Uh, it may indicate that uh, they simply uh, haven't been following the issue and they may be alerted to the issue once the notification process occurs. Uh, there's also the reality that a lot of residents who were opposed to the project may be somewhat uh, demoralized because of uh, unrelated debates but associated with uh, the Kaluk and some politics in that neighborhood. So, and potentially, who knows what happens between now and a public hearing. So, all of that is a roundabout way of saying is I think there are some pretty substantial risks to this project if it goes to public hearing. Uh, that said, I am going to vote the way I did in committee. I think this has been uh, debated since for about three years now. And I think it is time to close the chapter on this project, either by having it proceed or have it be rejected. And so I guess hearing from the general public is in order. Uh, but I think this is along the lines of a, there's only a handful of projects that have attracted this level of controversy. So it's, uh, it remains to be seen what the outcome of the public hearing will be. Thank you. Um, I didn't speak on this today at committee, and I won't say very much now, except I don't want us to get confused between height and stories. We gave direction with uh, regard to height, and a meter came off the building, just shy of a meter. That's not nothing. Um, we didn't say uh, reduce it to four stories. We said uh, consider the height. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll reserve any further comment on this project until we hear from a broad spectrum of the public, both current residents of the village and of Fairfield and potential future residents and uh, of the village and of Fairfield. Uh, so I'll leave it at that, but I, I just don't want it to go that, that, that nothing was done about the height. I think there, there was some um, uh, mitigation uh, efforts there, so just for the record. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor of forwarding this? Those opposed? Okay, two are opposed, seven are in favor. That will go ahead to public hearing. Uh, next, please, Mr. Coates. And it's directing staff to proceed with the amendments to the Heritage Property Protection Bylaw, amending the Land Use Procedures Bylaw, and aligning um, the city's regulations uh, with longstanding practices. Thanks. Moved by Councillor Thornton Joe, seconded by Councillor Alto. Discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, next, please, Mr. Coates. It's receiving the report on the operation of the community and senior centers for information and directing staff to provide an annual report on city facilities that are operated by nonprofit organizations and include financial inputs from those organizations. Thanks. Moved by Councillor Isaac, uh, seconded by Councillor Coleman. Councillor Isaac. Just a little um, amendment, um, including financial inputs and uh, public usage statistics or so public usage uh, information or data uh, sorry I'm playing yeah so uh, public usage data so okay, we, is, we, is there a seconder I'll second I'm not sure data is the right word but it'll get us started it's what we get I think it's valuable because we're, if we're saying to a, a cricket club for the first time or a, uh, a lawn bowling club for the first time in 50 years hey 
you have to tell us annually what you do. Uh, I think it's valuable if, if they want to say, hey, we rent this out to 47 groups a year and or we support these community efforts, then that gives a more rounded picture. Okay, thank you. Mr. Soulier, um, I think what we're looking for with this proposed amendment is that for city-owned facilities that are run by nonprofits that aren't community centers and community associations, we'd like to get a sense of uh, the public uh, also having access to these facilities. Um, is this public usage data, does that give you clear enough direction? It does, Mayor Helps. In fact, we'll be looking for all available information we can obtain uh, on these facilities, including both members-based and, and general public. Okay, use. thank you very much. Discussion on the amendment? Yes, Councillor Coleman. Thank you. I mean, I, it, it would seem to make sense. The problem I have is we've got a very specific recommendation dealing with community and senior centres. There's a range of different holdings out there. So Councillor Isaac mentioned the cricket club. I believe they actually own and built it, they, or did they don't need it? I don't know. But I'm not sure it's in the same ownership. It's on city land. Um, so I, I look at a range of those things, and we may want to do some work identifying all the different options before we bundle them into the same process that applies to communities and senior centers. Yeah, no, it's not going to be the same process. It's a separate process, a separate report. Yeah, and I think the fact that we don't know some of those things is a big problem. So then it should, then I would have to vote against this. And, but Sorry, can you turn on your microphone? Sorry, then I would vote against this, but if you brought it back as a second motion, or a separate motion, I would support it. Okay, uh, let's deal with the amendment, and then I have a proposal that will help. So all those in favor of the amendment? Any opposed? Councillor uh, Young, sorry, Councillor Coleman and Councillor Alto are opposed. I take Councillor Coleman's points that these are uh, separate um, items, so I would like to divide. Um, part one of the motion will be that we receive the report for information and then hit return a couple of times. Thank you. Uh, that's part two. We'll treat those as separate, and hopefully that will address Councillor Coleman's concern. And uh, the amendment obviously applies to part two. Okay, so any further discussion on part one? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you, that's carried. Uh, and part two, as amended. Further discussion? Okay, all of those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next, please, Mr. Coates. And that's uh, endorsing the uh, Victoria Waterways Loop, directing staff to report back at the December 1st quarterly update on the implications of adding to the strategic plan, working with partners to identify potential upgrades, committing to creating signage for the City of Victoria portion in 2017, referring to the 2018 budget, the potential infrastructure upgrades and additional signage, and requesting the mayor to send a letter outlining the city's support for the waterway loop to the CRD board and CRD parks committee. Thank you, moved by Councillor Loveday, uh, seconded by Councillor Lucas, and I'm gonna to go to Councillor Lucas because she worked on this with Councillor Loveday a little bit. Uh, further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you, next please. And that's uh, directing staff to include an expenditure of $1,200 in the 2017 financial plan from prior year's surplus to cover expenses for meetings of the Victoria Community Association Network. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Isaac, seconded by Councillor Loveday. Uh, discussion? Okay, all those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, we now move on to bylaws, and I will ask Mr. Coates to walk us through the bylaws. Uh, for first reading, there is Waterworks Amendment Bylaw Number 16-079, Sanitary Sewer and Storm Utilities, Storm Water Utilities Amendment Bylaw Number 16-080, and Solid Waste Amendment Bylaw Number 16-088 for first reading. Okay, could we have those bylaws for first reading, Council? Thank you. Moved by Councillor Coleman, seconded by Councillor Alto. Uh, any discussion? Okay, all those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. That's the same three bylaws for second reading. Thanks. Still moved by Councillor Coleman and still seconded by Councillor Alto. Uh, just, uh, all those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. And the same three bylaws for third reading. Okay, still moved by Councillor Coleman and seconded by Councillor Alto. Uh, all those in favour of third reading? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Uh, next, please. Uh, for adoption, it's housing agreement bylaw for 1016 Southgate. That's bylaw number 16-081. Thanks, moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor Lucas. Any discussion? Okay, uh, all those in favour? Any opposed? 
Thank you. Uh, we have three letters here for uh, our attention for information. Let's go through them one at a time. I didn't like how we just bundled the last just for transparency. So one at a time, Mr. Coates. Uh, first, it's a letter from the Union of BC Municipalities expressing appreciation for the participation that was re received from the city uh, hosting the 2016 UBCM convention. Okay. Thanks. Moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor Coleman. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, next. It's a letter from the Green Communities Committee congratulating the city on successfully achieving its cor corporate carbon neutrality for the 2015 reporting year. Very good. Thanks. Moved by Councillor Coleman, seconded by Councillor Lucas. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. And finally? A letter from the Minister of Children and Family Development uh, regarding raising awareness about adoption and finding homes for British Columbia's waiting children and youth. Thank you. Receipt's been moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor Lucas. Uh, all those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, we have no new business. Uh, it's now question period, so this is an opportunity for anyone uh, here in the public to ask us a question. Anyone wish to ask us a question? No? All right, no questions. Uh, very good. The next thing we need is a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor Coleman. Uh, all those in favour? Any opposed? Thanks. Uh, have a good long weekend uh, and a safe Remembrance Day, Council.